I'm actually so sick of the like low carb versus low fat tribalism. I'm, I'm, I'm sick of it because I really think that we just need to see our food as our food, try eat a healthy dietary pattern. And if you really want to get into the sort of more granular level of managing your health, then yeah, you could wear a CGM and you could play around with your carbohydrate intake depending on the context in which you've slept and exercised. Welcome to The Proof Podcast, a space for science-based conversation exploring the health and longevity benefits that come with mastering nutrition, physical exercise, mindfulness, recovery, sleep, and alignment. Facts, nuance, and trustworthy recommendations, minus the hyperbole. Hello, my friends. Welcome back. Great to be here with you. I'm your host, Simon Hill. I'm a qualified physiotherapist and nutritionist with an undergraduate science degree and a master's in the science of human nutrition. In my career, I've worked with many people, including elite professional athletes, to improve their health, performance, and longevity. And I'm currently involved in research with a group of nutrition scientists in Australia looking at dietary patterns and mental health. Today, I sit down with my good friend and exercise physiologist, Drew Harrisburg. We talk about the Hadza, a hunter-gatherer tribe in Africa, and their diet, red meat and health, the cardiovascular benefits of polyphenols in chocolate, why we should increase our daily steps, whether you can offset the effects of sitting down all day with an hour of exercise, whether we should train to failure when doing resistance training, and some more thoughts on continuous glucose monitors. Please do enjoy the episode, and I'll catch you on the other side. We're back. New podcast, new look. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's uh, it's actually a very strange feeling. For, for the people who aren't watching this, Simon has the blonde locks out, hatless, and spectacles. I haven't worn glasses in a long time. It looks good. Since I was actually a, a little kid. So I'm wearing these glasses so that I can get a break from the contact lenses. And it's it's a... A bit of adjusting to. Mm. Well, you know, if it makes you feel better. Yeah. I'll put mine on. Put yours on. They look great. They suit you. Clark Kent. Yeah. All right. Here he is. Welcome to the show, Clark Kent. <laughs> uh, you know, the strangest thing for me is that with contact lenses, I can just look everywhere mm. and everything's clear. Yep. Whereas with these... What I'm finding is difficult or requires some adjusting to is I feel like I have a very narrow field of vision. Yeah. If I look sort of down or around, things are just not that sharp. Distorted. Yeah. Yeah, Because the lens is sitting off your eye when a contact is flush with the Mm -hmm. cornea. So it makes sense. I guess now that you say that, when I look through my peripherals, it is warped. Yeah. It's kind of weird. So I'm kind of doing this because I figured that wearing contact lenses from – you know, six in the morning until eight, nine, ten o'clock at night, depending on what time I go to bed, is probably not the best thing for my eye, eye health. But I'm not a hundred percent sure if that's if there's any truth to that or not. But I know that uh, your dad's an op- ophthalmologist. Mm-hmm. Is that how you pronounce it? Ophthalmologist. Yeah. It's how do you tricky, spell that? Well, trick question. Yeah, that's 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 going to be O P. Correct. T H. No. So okay. you, you made the error that everyone makes. O P H. O P H. Folks, get that right. Okay. Ophthalmologist. Yeah. Um, H. <laughs> so that kind of goes to show I know very little about that field. <laughs> um, but I'm 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 keen to I'm going in to see your dad. Yeah. And he's going to do a review of my eyes. It'll be interesting. And uh, tell me how it's all going. He's going to. I'll just warn you ahead of time. His tactic in his uh, office is to use humour. To keep it lighthearted. I know. So I know you, you know my dad. Yeah. He'll nudge you. He'll poke <laughs> you a little bit, but he's yeah. a very good doctor and brilliant ophthalmologist. Yeah. I'd like to get him on the show at some I reckon point. that'd be such a good idea. Um, you know, I think our, our eye health is something, it's so important, mm. but it's one of those areas of our health that I think we rarely think, or at least I know myself personally, and, and I wear contact lenses. Yeah. I, I rarely think about what I should be doing. Uh, from a lifestyle point of view, yeah. to better my eye health. So true. You, you, I think part of that is because, like, in the media, you, you'll see campaigns about dental health and your body and your mind. But mm. who talks about eye health? 
It's mm. just not sexy or fun. Even though like most people have some kind of issue with their eyes, at least mm. as they age. But you're right. It's just it doesn't get attention. It's more about the aesthetic stuff. Yeah. But if you lose your eye health, eyes none are of that is everything. It's everything. It's scary to think. You know. Well, I mean, you would you would actually know because your eyes are pr pretty bad, right? Like if you don't yeah. have your glasses on, you can't see anything. Yeah, these have some serious corrective lenses in them. Uh, yeah. I think I'm uh, minus five, both eyes. I don't have astigmatism mm -hmm. as far as I'm aware. It's just my my vision of things far away. And I believe that some of that may be related to early habits in my life. Mm. And that's something I want to talk to your dad about. Very well, Because I think maybe. that's important information for parents yeah. to potentially help shape the environment so that their kids – grow up with uh, as good a eyesight as possible. Yeah. Uh, but I remember, you know, it, it felt like a, a, a switch when I was maybe eight or nine. Mm. I went through this stage where all of a sudden we'd be driving in the car and I was having difficulty reading the billboards. Mm. Uh, and, and I told my parents that and sure enough, when I went and got the, the eye test done, they said, yeah, you need some, some glasses. I wonder so, how long you lived like that before saying something mm. you know you sort of suffer in silence for a while and then yeah. you figure out one day you're like actually there was probably a period yeah but I, I i do think that it was something that did develop over time i don't think i was born like that mm. um which is it's interesting to think about because you know my brother has the same genetics his eyes are perfect yeah you know what's also kind of crazy is if we were living in survival circumstances you wouldn't last a week in the mm -hmm. wild. Imagine if you went on, remember that TV show I was talking about last uh, mm -hmm. pod? If you went on alone and mm -hmm. lost your glasses, you're done. You'd have yeah. to tap out. Like the survival, our survival relies so much on our vision. Mm -hmm. You'd be, you'd be toast. I would. <laughs> so yeah, would I, I wonder, I, and I wonder if there's any, any exercises that you can do yeah, I to, to retrain. So if you're, and it, may, it might be that once you go too far, it's irreversible. Mm. But I do wonder if, if you started to notice and it was sort of early on, can you intervene with any form of exercise, you know, looking at things far away, the horizon, yeah. um, light exposure, things like that. But that'll be cool to uh, explore with your dad. I'm sure he's across that. Yeah, that's a good question for him. But yeah, I think that um, we need to pay more attention definitely to our eyes. I've been wearing, I've tried contacts. Mm. I don't know how you do it, man. I think it's so uncomfortable. I just can't do it. It's Yeah. Well, the comfort, I know that it, that does tend to vary from person to person. Mm. Uh, for me, they're comfortable and it's just become one of those daily habits. For, I, I give it no thought. Mm. It, it doesn't require any energy. It just, I wake up and it's kind of just like brushing your teeth. Yeah, exactly. You know, you're not thinking about brushing and, and why you're brushing. You just do it. Right, exactly. Uh, so... Yeah, but I, I I have heard from many people that they they haven't found them as comfortable as I do. I'm not sure whether that's the type of lens or, or just you know some something else. That uh, yeah, I reckon it just takes getting used to. I think if I committed for for a month, I'd be totally mm -hmm. fine. I'd be used to it. Like anything else, you know, you get your body just adjusts. Okay, so I think we were going to start today with get it off your chest. Yeah, I think because <laughs> we decided that. Ending a podcast with, you know, a sort of ranty mood is probably not the best way to end. So let's get it off early and then we'll finish mm. with some positivity. Do you know what I've realized about get it off your chest? Yeah. I, I know for me personally, and I think I speak on behalf of you, I don't really hold things. You know, the, we, I often am tagged in things online and there might be some going back and forth and it's quite, I like to keep it quite lighthearted. And I think the moment that you then, you hold on to that, mm. you've taken that negative energy and yeah. it's become your own. Yeah. And so uh, while we have this segment, get it off your chest, <laughs> I do think it's, it's a reminder that you get to choose what you take on board and what you don't. So the purpose of this is, is more so just to, uh, to walk through some interesting things that we see yeah. online and give our thoughts on them. Yeah, I think you nailed it. This is like a lighthearted segment where we just have a laugh and we're not really walking around daily thinking about these things and, you know, holding a grudge by any means. This is this is as, you know, we're kind of facetious in the tone that we're using, you know, but it's just for fun. We're having a laugh and, okay. and it does help. Every now and then there is something that you really want to get out of your chest just to sort of let it go, let it go. So I think today's will be um, 
will be interesting. This mm. certainly is something that I, I didn't think about after we were tagged in that initial post. It's yeah. Sort of, so where are we starting? Um, all right. So I guess f- for this particular one, we're kind of merging the two segments into one. So we've got the get it off your chest is a segment we like to do mm-hmm. for the proof, the new, the new pod. Uh, and as silly well claim. As, yeah, or quacky claim of the week or whatever it is. There's some sort of quackery mm-hmm. that we've come across to do with, and it could be anything, but mostly nutrition science or some sort of health advice. This one happens to be a, a double whammy, so we're kind of smacking both out in one hit. Do you know what would be funny? Is if one of these episodes, the the quackery of the week or the, the silly claim that you bring is something that I said or vice versa. <laughs> <laughs> we'll pro- you know what's going to happen? I'm telling you, in six months' time, we're going to actually call ourselves out. Yeah. And that's part of it, right? This mm. is all, The whole thing with this so. is about the accountability. Mm-hmm. Like when, we, when we, we're not going after people, what we're doing is we're trying to hold people accountable to the information that they're putting out there. Mm-hmm. Whether it's a small post on social media or a podcast or whatever it is, if you're going to make a claim that may harm somebody and you're doing it in the interest of profit and personal mm-hmm. profit, uh, I think you have a responsibility, especially if you have a, if you have a large reach. Like the guy we're, we're going to be talking about today has a big reach. Mm-hmm. And this particular post, I think it had 100,000 likes, maybe 800 to 1,000 comments. So, I mean, we're talking, yeah. people are seeing this stuff. Yeah. And it's it's not just about holding them accountable, but it's also, it's a learning exercise for everyone else yeah. to think about claims that are made online and, and how to navigate that where there are so many conflicting claims out there and it's so confusing. And I think the the goal here is to be able to better navigate that. That way you can then find really good quality information to then inform, you know, choices that you make in your life. Exactly. This is almost like uncovering the psychology of these kinds of cl- mm-hmm. claims and posts. That they're, they're all quite similar, as you'll, you'll see. They're very similar. They take a very small truth and they sort of blow it up into this, I guess, not, not I wouldn't call it a lie, but some kind of misinformation. It's mm-hmm. just like a remolding of the truth. Um, so do you want to jump into it? You can... Yeah, so this the first one that we're looking at here was a Bear Grylls post. And... I didn't follow him, by the way. I, yeah, neither. I like him. I, I've always thought he's very entertaining, but yeah, we were tagged in mm-hmm. this post together. And essentially, it was a, a photo of uh, a member of the Hadza, which is a tribe in Africa. Uh, at least I believe the photo is is of someone, uh, a member of the Hadza. And the post, and you might have the exact post that you can I'm kind looking of at read it right out now, there. Yeah. Do you want to read the, the post? Well, I'm out? looking at the image. So the first thing I see is you see this totally ripped like beautiful body composition quite a lot of muscle it's a hunter he's pulling back an arrow and he's sort of aiming it at a what mm-hmm. you can't see what it is but you assume it's some sort of native animal there and the first thing you see is but that helps set it up because he's not sitting down eating a bowl of berries <laughs> exactly yeah so the first thing you see is that he's in hunting mode mm-hmm. um and then you assume that this person obviously you know, hunts daily or does this this all the time. And that's why he looks the way he looks and that's why he's able to survive uh, out in nature for essentially his entire life. Which the Hadza do hunt. So we're not we're not claiming that they, they do not hunt. It's more the the caption and, and the sort of the way that, that Bear Grylls has positioned this. Yeah, exactly. I think in the sake of time, I'm probably not going to read the whole caption because it's pretty long. But in a nutshell, you know, Bear Grylls went out and put this post up of this this hunter in, or, well, it's a hunter gatherer, but it looks like a hunter in in the Hadza. Um, and essentially, the takeaway is that meat, organs, and fat from the biggest animals that they can hunt is the predominant source of calories in their mm-hmm. diet, and it's the reason why they thrive and they're so healthy mm-hmm. out in the wild. And he seems to be basing that off of some conversations with uh, Carnivore MD, uh, that's that's the name he goes by, Paul mm. Saladino, who's a psychiatrist that is fairly well known for following a sort of carnivore, all meat or close to all meat uh, diet. And... And, and I believe that Paul has gone and, and spent some days with the Hadza mm. and, and uses that to kind of describe what they eat. Yeah. And so, of course, within his community, uh, everyone takes that uh, information 
uh, accepts that information on, on face value as being reflective of how the hard to do eat. Mm-hmm. The interesting thing is, and listeners of this show will remember that I had Herman Ponza on the show, who is an anthropologist and you know, highly, highly regarded scientist, one of the leading anthropologists in the world. And he has spent time with the Hadza, living with them and actually documenting what they eat over the year, not just one point in time, a weekend, mm. and, and is able to see how things change seasonally and also look at the contribution of different foods to their diet by percentage of calories, which is really important. Mm. And so what was interesting was that this was brought up on both Instagram and Twitter and we were tagged into to, on, on Instagram, we were both tagged in and then I was tagged into something on Twitter. Mm. And uh, Herman Ponser actually uh, responded to that on, on Twitter. And he said, this is a lazy take by Grills. Listening to Saladino about the Hadza instead of people who actually work with their community is like learning marine biology from some dude who took a carnival cruise once. Here's what the Hadza folks typically eat as a percentage of calories. And he shows this chart, which is from one of his research papers. Mm. And it's a, a chart that I'll put into the show notes. And it essentially breaks down the percentage of calories from various food groups by by month. So there's 12 different months there and there's honey, meat, baobab, uh, berry, and tubers. And clearly what you see, first of all, is that the Hadza do not get most or all of their calories from animal foods. Mm. That's very clear immediately. Mm. You see that something else you see is that the diet varies a lot month to month. You see that on average, they're getting about 50% of their calories from plants and very interestingly, about 20 to 30% from honey. In some months, significantly more. If you look at month four, I'd, I mean, off the top of my head, that looks about 70% mm-hmm. or more comes from honey. Mm-hmm. And most months, animal foods are less than 30% of their calories. There is one month that is a bit of an outlier. And even in that month, it's 50% plant, 50% mm-hmm. animal. So you can you can see very clearly this is not aligned with the information that Bear Grylls has shared or what Paul Saladino shares with his mm. community. I've got to say, I, I actually, before you showed me this graph and I got this great visual, I probably would have believed that post. Like on face value, not knowing the true scientific research mm-hmm. that's gone into this this community, it, it kind of would make sense that it would be a predominantly meat-based diet I certainly would not have thought they would get so much honey in the diet. That, that really surprised me. And then again, when you sort of scan across this graph, because it's, what, what would you call this graph? It's like a bar graph, but it's color-coded. So you can really clearly see mm-hmm. the contribution of each food uh, into the daily. I get a lot of calories from berries. Berries and honey. Yeah, pr- like you see a lot, but what you do see is when the honey drops off, which is in months sort of 7 to 12, that's when the meat kind of kicks in and you get more calories from meat. Mm-hmm. So it's this really nice seesaw mm-hmm. where they're never actually eating what it looks like anyway from this. They're never eating a heap of honey and meat in the same month. It's mm-hmm. this seesawing of availability of food which balances their calories out mm-hmm. on a monthly basis, which is, I think is really interesting. And I think one of the interesting learnings here is that whenever we're, we're thinking about a claim and the, the data that informs it, we should be thinking about the strength of that data. Mm. So here is Herman Ponza, who is an anthropologist. He has gone there and actually lived with the Hadza and has documented what their eating habits over a year or more to formulate this, this graph. Mm. Yet there are people who are, uh, are a false, falsely um, equating the, the observations of Paul Saladino who, uh, and someone comes in here on Twitter and says, Saladino actually went there, he spent time with them and is familiar with the contradictions in the literature, no credit, question mark. And Herman Ponsa, again, he replies here and he says, he visited a tourist camp. <laughs> Some folks at those camps, wonderful as they are, are not even Hadza. That's not real ecology. So no, I don't credit his observations as meaningful or real ecology. Now, 
the disappointing thing is not everyone within that community will see this and many people that do see it will not accept it and it is because a lot of their dietary choice is not actually based upon science. There is a whole lot of ideology tied into that and so it can be hard to change their view with with facts. 100%. This goes back to who you can reach, you know. So a, a guy like Ponza who doesn't have, a, I assume, a reach like Bear Grylls who has mm. like millions and millions of followers – despite having really credible information that will help people understand how this community lives, he just can't get that message out. Mm. I mean, he, obviously, you can rely on people like yourself and other podcasters to, to explain this stuff, but you get a guy like Bear Grylls who in 60 seconds throws up a caption with an image and all of a sudden 90,000 people think that the best thing to do for you know, body composition, health, and longevity is to start mm. eating more, as much meat and fat and organs as possible. Mm. And I mean, the craze at the moment, the carnival craze, you know, which is led by Carnivore MD. I don't know, was he 2.0, 3.0 now? I don't know how many times his account's been removed, but he's yeah. he's leading the way with now Liver King, who's just popped mm. up and become this viral sensation overnight. These guys are making the carnivore diet seem really cool. Mm -hmm. Definitely, but guess guess what? When you end up with colorectal cancer or cardiovascular disease in your 60s or 70s, where are these guys? Mm. They're not around for you to, to hold accountable. So I would just say, you know, be, be careful mm. about the information that exists. And I think really, you know, we have to firstly acknowledge that there are many sick people in this world. And also there, are, you know, a lot of the time, all of us are vulnerable to confirmation bias and wanting to hear things that, uh, that make us feel good. Mm. And being told that foods that we love to eat that have been a big part of our lives um, to date are not unhealthy and we can consume them at any level and we can double down on them. That's, that's something that for many of us feels really good. And that's where I see, uh, where I believe a lot of these guys have achieved sort of great growth in terms mm. of their communities. 100%. And they also they also have a very simplified message. So the nuance is gone. Mm. And when you take that absolute message and you oversimplify things, uh, it can be a little more sexy. Mm. And unfortunately, the more nuanced style, it, it doesn't, it doesn't cr create the same momentum or growth on social media. And you're right, Perm and Ponsa doesn't have uh, as big a platform. And I would say even look at someone like Lane Norton. I mm. think Lane Norton, if he took a very extreme point of view position, mm -hmm. he would have a far greater community. Yeah. He's one of the people out there who has a huge community as it is, yet is giving nuanced information, but he's a rare, that's that's very rare yeah. to, to sort of find. So, um, But just for the record, we're not coming at this defending plants through an ideology. We are just trying to point out that the truth of, of this diet based on mm. like real science. Like you, we're not here to debunk uh, that they eat a lot of meat every single month because we're plant-based. It's not at all. I, I would not care if they ate 100% meat. The, the, would you? The point of this is just to highlight where the claim was, right. where the data exists. And you're right, the hard side do, meat is an important part of their diet. If we zoomed right back out, I would I would ask why we're even thinking about the hard side in yeah. terms of... Uh, trying to kind of generalize that to to our lives. You know, they live a very different lifestyle. They walk about 18 kilometers mm. a day. They're not sitting down all day, something that we might talk about mm -hmm. um, coming up. And to, to be honest, in terms of good, valid data, looking at how long they live, what diseases they get, we don't really have that. Their public health records are, are not the same as, yeah. and I think people can probably appreciate that. Yeah. Um, they're not surrounded by the same public health infrastructure. Many of them, from from what I believe, do not even know their own age. Yeah. So it, it gets difficult to kind of understand how truly healthy they are. Mm. Surely they're healthier than people eating a standard Western diet who are sitting down all day. There's no argument about no that. Argument. They eat an unprocessed diet. They're lean and they they get it, they move around and, and they're active yep. all the time. We know that that stuff's really good for, for promoting health. Yeah. Um, I just think that we have, if we were zooming back out and saying, well, what's the best data to look at for sort of optimal uh, health and longevity? 
I probably wouldn't be looking at that population. I would, I'd be looking at, at other large observational studies yep. uh, where we have better data on health outcomes. Yep. When are people getting cardiovascular disease, various types of cancer, dementia, how long people are living, and that's probably a bit more robust. So th- us coming in and speaking about the hard zero is, is more just related to the, the claim that was made. Yeah, and one final point on that. Even if you and I decided to try eating like a hard zero today, the quality of the meat that they eat and the berries that they find and the tubers is so different to our mm-hmm. modern day supermarket meat and, and tubers. Mm-hmm. Like it's just, you can't compare the, I'd, I'd argue that the nutrient quantity, sort of the nutritional value of the food that we get is no, probably nowhere mm-hmm. near as, as nutrient dense as what mm-hmm. they get. The meat is certainly for most people going to be sort of factory farm, slaughterhouse meat. Mm-hmm. We're not eating wild game. We're not getting f- wild berries. It's just such a different mm-hmm. It's almost a different world, you could you could say. Yeah, and and just to to kind of zoom in again on on the purpose of this is it's more to look at how something can be very distorted mm. because what we don't see is people referring to the hard so within these uh, these groups on social media. They're not telling you that across the board, you know, twenty to thirty percent of their calories are coming from honey, which is essentially refined carbohydrates. Sure, it has a few extra sort of properties, mm. but it is essentially uh, refined uh, sugars. So yeah. um, there's there's a misrepresentation, and there's often a lot of information left out. Mm. And I think maybe a responsible way. This is my my take on it, my layman's approach. If I look at month one to six, it looks to me like the Hadza are a gatherer hunter society and then month seven to sort of 11 12 it looks more like a hunter gatherer mm-hmm. society just based on on the the like i said that seesaw effect of mm. meat goes up towards the back end of the, of the year and then the front end of the year it's a lot more hunter. and remember this is one tribe if you mm. look across all the data looking at tribes across the world what you see, and I think the most important thing here is they're not eating ultra-processed foods. Yeah. So if you look across tribes all across the world, the percentage of calories from animal foods and plant foods, it varies from tribe to tribe. Mm. They do seem to have similar health where there is some data looking at, at health. Uh, and so it does seem that the commonality mm. is that they're eating real food most of the time and they're managing their body weight. Mm. So I think that's probably the the most that we can take out of these yeah. these groups. And to, and to simply just point at the meat as the reason why they are healthy and lean is just it's a misrepresentation. That comes into uh, the next post actually, which okay. is one that I've contributed. Okay, this that, is good. The, the the previous uh, post was your contribution, so now mm-hmm. it's my turn. Uh, Stephen Lynn, Doctor Stephen Lynn, he's back. He's back. He's not going anywhere. He's uh he's my favorite dentist at the moment. <laughs> Functional dentist. <laughs> yes. Okay, get it right. Uh anyway, he's back. He has done a post on why red meat is a superfood and he essentially just calls out some of the key nutrients like iron, uh, vitamin A, creatine, vitamin B1. Uh there's no debating that those nutrients are are found in red meat, but I often see this, and I, I think I commented on this last episode, it's very reductionist to say a food is rich in this, therefore it must be good for your health. Mm-hmm. Because you have to consider the whole package. What else is coming along for the ride? Mm-hmm. Is there a lot of saturated fat, dietary cholesterol, heme iron, things that we know are associated with disease? And I, I think, again, this post, if you look through the comments, there are a number of people that are relieved to finally see that you know red meat is actually healthy. And I just want to remind people, we have great data on how red meat affects physiology and health outcomes. Mm. And this is actually top tier evidence. We have uh, randomized controlled trials like a 2019 paper from Bergeron et al. And what they specifically did was compare red meat to white meat to plant protein. And the interesting thing is often people say, well, it's the saturated fat in meat, but if you eat lean meat, then it doesn't matter. Well, what they actually wanted to investigate was within the context of a low saturated fat diet, is there a difference between red meat, white meat, and plant protein when it comes to the amount, the concentration of atherogenic lipoprotein? So these are the uh, the proteins in our blood that carry cholesterol and triglycerides, these are the ones that can penetrate the artery wall and uh, kickstart the 
atherosclerosis cascade, which results in like plaque buildup, fatty fatty plaque build up in your artery and you can imagine over time that starts to restrict blood flow and can cause a heart attack. Mm. So they wanted to see simply within the context of low saturated fat, so we're making it quite equal there, Mm -hmm. is there a difference between red meat, white meat and plant protein on the number of those atherogenic uh, particles and they saw within a four week period, uh, people that had uh, were eating red meat or white meat uh, had a much greater uh, increase in the ApoB uh, containing lipoproteins, which are the atherogenic ones, compared to plant protein. Mm-hmm. So that's uh, something I just wanted to, to r- remind people on. So despite the, the fact that red meat might contain a, a few nutrients, there are other components mm. and we have to consider the overall matrix and how does it affect either, either established biomarkers of disease or health outcomes. And I'll talk about health outcomes mm. in a second. So re- really recent study, this was uh, looking at the Adventist health uh, population uh, in America, 77,000 men and women. And they wanted to to look at the contribution or how ultra processed food and animal-based foods affected mortality. So death mm. and from any cause. And they found that while yes, ultra processed foods, as we know and would predict, do increase total mortality, which means increase your risk of premature death. They also found the same thing for red meat. Mm. And they found that comparing folks that were were getting about 6% of their calories from red meat, which is not a lot, no. compared to those who were getting 0% of calories from red meat, they had a 14% greater relative risk of dying during the follow-up period. So... We can, we can definitely acknowledge that red meat does contain certain nutrients yep. and that might be really important within the context of a population where there is not good food security mm. and you don't have other options. Mm. Then all of a sudden, granted, you know, red meat could be a really important food for that population to achieve nutritional adequacy. But when we do have substitutions and people can eat more plant protein and fish, because we know moving to fish is also a good substitution, I think that these posts like this one here mm. from Dr. Stephen Lin, why red meat is a superfood is reductionist. It's an oversimplification. And what it's not doing is telling people that when you eat more of those foods and you're eating less lentils, beans, and fish, you're actually increasing your risk of premature death, total yeah. mortality. And so in fairness to <clears throat> the folks reading the post, I think you need to have all of that context there. Mm. When you look at this post, so there's this big, bold title, why red meat is a superfood. Firstly, for me, the word superfood, it just ruffles my feathers a bit. There's something about that that kind of annoys me because how do we differentiate between a food and a superfood? What makes a food a superfood? If it is the ingredients list that he's, or sorry, not the ingredients list, the nutrient list that he's sort of put around this picture of the, the steak, can we not get those same nutrients elsewhere in the diet, therefore making other ingredients superfoods as well? So... I guess my question to you is, should we be looking at food as ingredients or nutrients? Does that make sense? So I've heard, I hear a lot of plant-based doctors saying, mm. you know, instead of thinking about your, your uh, ingredient, so that what the food is that you're eating, think about where you can find the nutrients that are in that food elsewhere. Mm. In other words, can we get, so I'll go through this, this list that he's right, vitamin E, CoQ10, creatine, taurine, um, choline. Some of these are non-essential, by the way. The body makes them. <laughs> Good point. Uh, the B vitamins, uh, carnitine, carnosine, and then iron, potassium, selenium, and zinc. Can I think we get this those? is getting caught in the weeds yeah. for most people. I think even thinking about you know, drilling in, sure, certain uh, nutrients, if you have an issue like iron, you might want to consider where you can get it from, red meat versus other foods, and how you can increase absorption if it's coming from plants. But I think, to be honest... I agree with you, there's no one superfood. And if you wanted to be, to use the word super, we'd be better off thinking about it as a kind of super dietary pattern. Mm. And and what makes more sense than thinking that one single food is going to be the savior right. or, or have exactly. tremendous impact. What matters most is the shape of your overall dietary pattern yep. and consistency with that over decades. Yep. So again, I think, you know, 
drilling down to this level, it can be interesting and it can be important depending on someone's personal uh, circumstances and you know blood test results and things like that. But overall, I would just caution that it's taking us away from what's most important. Yeah. And that is what what dietary pattern are you eating? Mm. The, uh, the types of foods that you're eating regularly that make up your breakfast, lunch, dinner, and snacks. And what do we know about the inclusion of those foods in terms of how that affects your biomarkers, well-established biomarkers for disease, cholesterol, blood glucose control, et cetera, and also actual health outcomes. Yeah. When people eat like that, like you are, how long are they living? Mm-hmm. How likely are they to develop various cancers and cardiovascular disease? And for me, I think that's much more per, much more meaningful data, Agreed. and that's what I use to to make the the food choices that I do. Agreed. I think the the superfood that terminology is a distraction because I would say almost everyone doesn't eat one single food to get all their nutrients. Right? We spread them across a diverse mm-hmm. array of foods, and you end up getting all of these nutrients anyway. So yeah, I mean, if in a hypothetical scenario, if you could only eat one food for the rest of your life and you had a choice between a piece of steak, as Stephen Lynn recommends, or a banana, yeah, maybe it's a different nutrient profile, but no one's doing that. Mm-hmm. We're, we're eating, ba- most people eating balanced diets, I hope. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we have to come back to the context yeah. of understanding that we have, most of us have that, that food security that allows for a myriad of food right. options. And yeah, I would just caution people when we're reducing things to single isolated nutrients yeah. in food and using that to then label that food as a superfood. Yeah, agreed. Okay, well, I think we've comprehensively uh, gotten <laughs> a few things yeah. off our chest. I think we're going to make a pact. Next time we do this, Dr. Stephen Lynn will not feature. All right, we're going to keep him out of this conversation. Unless he wants to come on the show. And and I think I said it last time, I am I am completely comfortable with inviting him on and sitting down and, and yeah. trying to understand the way that he thinks about nutrition and, and health mm. and sharing some of this feedback and, yeah. and seeing what he thinks about it. It's a friendly it. invitation. I also think that it's important for people to understand that when you – start speaking about a topic over and over and, and you're sort of preaching to the converted, you're creating an echo chamber, right? So for us to sort of venture outside of plant-based nutrition and start talking about other sort of nutritional approaches that people are putting out there, what we're saying is let's not make this an echo chamber. Let's talk mm. to people and share information that is maybe a little bit different because if we were just talking about plant-based nutrition every single week, month after month, year after year, mm. You create this echo chamber in this community, in this audience that already know what you're talking about and they agree with what you're saying and you're not really changing people's Mm. uh, ideas of nutrition science. I've learned some things from the likes of Paul Saladino and his community. Yeah, go on. Let me hear this. Uh, And and I I would say that uh, not directly but indirectly. Mm. So I think that it cannot be denied that a carnivore style diet, because I think where people listening to this might be getting confused is they might think, well, hang on, I know someone that adopted a carnivore diet, all meat, and they feel great. Mm-hmm. And, and, and so I've seen that as well. And I think that you'd be a silly, foolish person to deny that there are certain people out there who are achieving at least short-term benefits yeah. in removing some uh, plant foods and probably a lot of ultra-processed foods from their diet and going to a a sort of all carnivore or animal, very animal-based diet. And I think that this is actually completely explainable in the literature. Mm. And I'm really uh, excited. We're recording this uh, ahead of me releasing a conversation with Justin and Erica Sonnenberg. But I... And that conversation there was on the microbiome. They're two leading uh, researchers from Stanford University, microbiologists. They've actually spent a lot of time with the Hadza mm-hmm. um, and they have a book called The Good Gut. Uh, but I, I think that a lot of this comes back down to dysbiosis and disruption of the microbiome. Mm-hmm. And what, we're, what we've seen is that uh, as a result of living in a modern industrialized world with over sanitization, ultra processed food consumption, that all these foods lack a lot of fiber, 
uh, there are other um, lifestyle influences, you know, uh, perhaps unnecessary use of antibiotics or overuse. Mm -hmm. We've seen this very damaged microbiome. And with that damage, you lose bacteria that are capable of breaking down fiber. Mm -hmm. You've lost these fiber degraders. And you and I know that those fiber degraders, they're actually key because your gut is like a pharmacy. When the bacteria is feeding on these prebiotics, it's dispensing drug-like molecules mm -hmm. that go into your blood and affect your mood. They affect your blood glucose control. They affect your lipids. And when you have a disrupted microbiome and you lose that capacity, you're missing out on those rewards. Mm -hmm. However, we also know that if you are, if you are, uh, if you have the disrupted microbiome, just putting in a whole lot of fiber and plants may not fix it for a lot of people, and it might actually increase inflammation. Mm -hmm. And we know that from a recent study, the fermented versus fiber food study, where a certain percentage of people adding fiber to their diet, it actually made them worse. Mm -hmm. And you might rev up inflammation, and so people with these inflammatory conditions might actually feel worse by adding more plant foods, whole plant foods. And and you and I work with people. I, I've received this feedback. I know that certain people, mm. when you get them to eat more whole plant foods, at least initially, they don't feel so great. No. And so there is a role for elimination style diets. Right. And that is saying, okay, we've got these triggers that their microbiome is compromised, they're not handling, it's revving up inflammation. When we take those out, we can help settle them down. Mm. And I think that's what's happening with the carnivore diet. Yeah. You're seeing people that are removing all these foods, they do feel better. I would just caution against thinking that that is a dietary pattern that's going to serve you best for the rest of your life. Mm. What I would say is you want that pharmacy in your gut firing again and mm. dispensing those, those drug-like molecules that are... Uh, maybe not essential for survival, but they are essential for health span. Yep. And so uh, that then the, the question is, how do you help that person reshape their microbiome and get back to a position where they can degrade these yep. the, the fiber? Yep. And I think that's, that's, that's a really uh, fun and interesting area that we need few, more science to explore so we know what are the best protocols. Mm -hmm. Is it that they need certain probiotics or do you introduce fermented foods first? Yep. Uh, or do you introduce polyphenols, which we know we act as, pre as prebiotics but maybe aren't as fermentable and cause bloating and gas mm -hmm. and trying to, to, to structure a program that allows them to get plant diversity back into their diet. And so... My, my message to people would be, you may have experienced benefit on the carnivore diet, you may have friends that have, but think about it as an elimination diet. Yep. There, is, there is a very uh, logical explanation for why you would feel better, yep. but based on all of the science we have, eating those foods at, at a high exposure level long term mm. is probably not going to serve you well in terms of colorectal cancer risk, cardiovascular disease risk, uh, dementia, and, and so on. So if someone's on a carnivore diet for, say, one year, two years plus, and they're eating zero fiber, mm -hmm. what do you think happens to their gut microbiome over a two-year span of just eating meat? Well, I think they'll lose diversity. We know that. We know, we know uh, a few things. We know, we know uh, overall people that have more unique plants in their diet have greater diversity yep. than people eating you know, fewer, 10 or fewer. People that have 30 or more unique plants in a week have much more diversity in their microbiome. Mm. And what, sorry to interrupt. What about total number of microbiotic cells or whatever, whatever you I'm call it? I'm not sure it? On, on total count. I wonder if the count would go down. Or, or does it just create this dysbiosis, like you said, where it's yeah. a lack of diversity and you have like a dominant? Yeah, well, you it may not go down the total count, but you might have more pathogenic inflammatory bacteria. Right. And we have seen that. So there was a, and this was, you know, it was a five day, so it's a short term, but they looked at an all animal based uh, diet versus a plant based diet. Oh, really? And not many people speak about this. It was published in Nature, leading leading journal in the world. And just in five days of going to an all animal based diet, and this was mainly um, red meat, there was some white meat, I think. Uh, there was also some, uh, some salami and stuff in there and eggs mm -hmm. and some cheese. Uh, just in five days of going to that, it, it, it resulted in a significant increase in pro-inflammatory bacteria. 
and a type of bacteria called Biophilia wadsworthia, which is um, a bacteria that we see with inflammatory bowel disease wow. in increased numbers. So um, I, I'm not sure to answer your question what mm. happens to total count, but mm. I think what would definitely happen is you'd lose diversity and you might see increased numbers of pathogenic bacteria, which are some, somewhat outnumbering the health, healthy bacteria. Mm -hmm. And that's what we call dysbiosis. Yeah, interesting. So it, in a sense, if you do go on a carnival diet or you know what we think as some kind of elimination diet, it's sort of like if you're fasting, your symptoms can go away, right? Like if, mm -hmm. if anyone just stops eating, let's say you've got gut, gut uh, disturbances or you have symptomatic gut disorder and you fast for long periods, when you don't have that food coming in as that signal to the gut, your symptoms can go away. So it yeah. kind of acts in a way like you're, in a sense, fasting because you're not having fiber coming through the tract. One of the interesting things though to think about here, and this is where I think the Sonnenbergs are, are somewhat, I guess, worried about a diet that doesn't have fiber, mm. is that there's a mucosal layer that's very important between bacteria and your uh, intestinal cells. And it, it acts like a fence mm -hmm. between neighbors. So it's stopping things getting through that otherwise shouldn't and allows things to get through that should. Maybe a gate is a better way of describing it. Yep. And uh, what happens is that that mucosal layer is actually made up. There's some carbohydrates in there. And so if you starve your, uh, your microbiome of fiber, mm -hmm. the bacteria start eating the mucosal layer. Wow. They literally eat your body. Right. And so- Because those bacteria want carbohydrate as their food source. Right. And so thin wow. and thinning of that mucosal layer over time can then, can then contribute or, or result in the movement of particles, uh, inflammatory molecules right. into, into the, the bloodstream, which is a problematic long-term. Right. So this is why microbiologists wow, and even registered dietitians, when you think about elimination diets, yeah. they're short-term. Mm. Low FODMAP diet, carnivore diet, all of this stuff really should be thought about as a, a short-term intervention. Interesting. So that what you just mentioned there, is that the colloquial leaky gut that people yeah, talk about? Yeah, it's, it's part of that sort of cascade. Oh, like in the intestinal permeability. That. Wow, that's really interesting. Mm -hmm. I looked into that a lot with when I was diagnosed with diabetes because I was interested into the mechanism of the pathogenesis like how did you mm. how does somebody develop type 1 diabetes and i found a paper um that was looking at uh, from memory it was gliadin induced zonulin release in other words mm -hmm. gliadin which i think is a is a molecular sort of sub particle of, of gluten i could be wrong with that but it's in the gluten family can trigger this zonulin which i believe mm -hmm. is a, some genetic trigger that can increase intestinal permeability and there's sort of like theories online that maybe a very high gluten diet could increase, you know, mm. this leaky gut as you colloquially, colloquially mm. call and it. And it might come down to what someone's baseline microbiome look like. Right. That could make them vulnerable or, or not. Yeah. Uh, zonulin is a biomarker for intestinal permeability. Yep. It's often measured in studies. Yep. They look at an intervention, what happens to zonulin levels and say, oh, that, might, that, that intervention helped intestinal permeability. Yep or didn't, and there was an interesting study called the Maple Study, and it was interested in looking at polyphenols mm -hmm. in particular, in people that had increased intestinal permeability. And polyphenols are really interesting. I think we may have covered this, but uh, they like prebiotic fiber. They will selectively feed different bacteria. Mm -hmm. And so uh, polyphenols are in uh, a lot of different plant foods, but they're very rich in things like chocolate and green tea and coffee uh, and apples and apple puree, for example, which this study used. And, and what they did was in this randomized controlled trial, looked at the addition of polyphenols to the diet, what happens to zonulin. Mm. And they did see, they saw a decrease in, zon in zonulin, zonulin as you add polyphenol rich foods into the diet uh, suggesting that these polyphenols have a favorable effect on that barrier because mm. when I when I looked into this all those years ago it was like 10 years ago now the reason that it came up as even a point of talking about type 1 diabetes diagnosis is because there's quite a big overlap between celiac disease and type 1 mm -hmm. and this particular researcher I think his name's Alessio Fasano he's like the godfather of celiac research 
he was actually looking into what happens in people who have celiac and what happens to their zonion levels and their, their intestinal permeability. And then knowing that it overlaps so much with type 1, because I think it's like 20% of people with type 1 can develop a celiac disease. It's a high, quite a high percentage. So when I saw that, I was thinking, I better go gluten-free just in case. Mm -hmm. I, I, not that I'm saying gluten causes, type, I'm not saying that at all. It doesn't cause celiac or type 1. But if it was a trigger that could be increasing zonulin and intestinal permeability, I just thought maybe, you know, it's a do no harm approach to just mm. remove gluten from my diet and replace it with, you know, other foods that I can get the same nutrients out of the sort of gluten containing grains. Mm -hmm. Not the gluten free packaged foods? Not the packaged, more things like brown rice, quinoa, okay. other grains. So I thought it was really interesting that firstly that celiac and type 1 have such a big overlap and then maybe mechanistically it does come down to this gut permeability. Mm -hmm. But I think, I don't think the jury's out on that one yet. I think that's still very much a hypothesis. I don't think anyone really knows the, the cause of type 1 diabetes mm -hmm. and certainly isn't eating gluten. That's, it's got to be a storm, you know, a perfect mm -hmm. storm. Okay. Should we, I know we wanted to, to close off on a few things CGM related. Mm. Yeah. So we spoke about CGMs a lot last episode and I was having a think back, you know, when we finished as to potential things that we may have left out or mm -hmm. sort of glossed over a little bit. Let's recap where we got to. Yeah, I don't remember exactly <laughs> what we covered because we <laughs> we spoke about it a lot. Um, but I think the the overall message that we were uh, trying to deliver was that CGMs can have some utility, but be wary of this idea of just flatlining blood glucose uh, because there is a potential if you went down that route that the changes you would make to your diet would reduce your overall dietary quality. That's right. And and shift you away from a dietary pattern that we know is health promoting. So I think what we wanted to leave people with there in that episode was that we understand what a healthy dietary pattern is. Mm -hmm. And I believe that using a CGM, it's it shouldn't take you away from that. It should just help you modify within that theme. Yeah. I think what we what we said you know, for the benefits of a CGM were that if we were to give hypothetically a CGM mm -hmm. to everybody, you're going to diagnose some mm -hmm. undiagnosed diabetes, which is probably really We should good. just define a CGM just right. in case someone's catching this one without okay. having listened to the other one. So a continuous glucose monitor. It's a di it was essentially it's for diabetics to wear, um, to manage their blood glucose levels. Well, it's actually not even blood glucose. Did you know that? Mm -hmm. It's measuring interstitial fluid. Mm -hmm. But that can reflect what your blood glucose okay. levels are doing. And so they're it's actually- It's a proxy. It's a proxy. There's a, there's a slight delay between your blood glucose and the interstitial fluid that gets measured with the CGM. Mm -hmm. It's about a 15 minute delay. So it's picking up sort of 15 minutes after uh, your whatever your blood glucose level is at a given point of time, your CGM will be just a little bit delayed. Mm -hmm. But essentially it's doing the job that it needs to do. And we were thinking that if you could give a CGM to everybody out there in the population, even people without diabetes, you'll probably diagnose some insulin resistance or glucose uh, impaired glucose tolerance or even diabetes that has not been diagnosed. So, Which would be a good thing. Which would be fantastic. There's, there's a great benefit there. And you'd see it pretty clearly in the data mm -hmm. as to when the numbers are sort of abnormal, you'd get that instantly. So in real okay. time, you will know whether or not you've had a very abnormal blood glucose reading and, and if you're pre-diabetic or diabetic. Mm -hmm. So I think that's a great utility. The other thing that it can help people with is identifying whether or not these highs and lows, this roller coaster of a high spike followed by a, a low that goes outside of the normal range, whether that is uh, influencing their food choices because that can lead to cravings. Mm -hmm. When you have a hypoglycemic episode, Anyone with type 1 who's listening to this will know when your blood glucose goes below, say, 3.6, you get ravenous for, for sweets, mm -hmm. for sugar, for glucose. You don't crave fatty food. You don't crave mm. savory food. You really are looking it's for that. It's a survival so, mechanism. Absolutely. You, your body knows that the blood glucose is at a dangerous level below the normal range. You will be starving your brain of glucose. So it just creates this appetite mm -hmm. to find sweetness, carbohydrates, glucose. Now, if you are noticing that you're having a rebound effect from, so let's say, let's say you, I'll give you, an, for example, Simon, if you were a CGM and you saw that your blood glucose after a meal went outside of the normal range quite high, 
and then maybe within 30 minutes or an hour, drops down below where you started. So it's like a rebound hypo. That might lead to food choices that are less favorable long term, such as that sweet mm-hmm. junk food. Like I was You're riding a roller coaster. You are. And your body's trying to bring you back up into a normal range. And then you end up essentially riding the roller coaster all day because you overeat the mm-hmm. sugary food in response to the low. And you bounce back up mm-hmm. and back down and so on and so forth. This happens with a lot of people with diabetes, in mm-hmm. particular type 1. If you have a low blood glucose, a lot of people try to correct it with, say, eating jelly beans or some sort of glucose mm-hmm. tablet, which is the correct thing to do. But if you overcorrect, you then go high again. You have to either administer insulin to try to bring yourself back down or do some activity. And if you then give too much insulin, you go back below the normal range again. And it's just this rebounding mm-hmm. effect up and down. So can I ask you a question? Yeah. Let's say that you get the, the high and the low outside of the normal range. How do you determine how much that's influenced by the meal that you've just had versus other factors, parts of your lifestyle that we know affect blood glucose control. So th- this is the point that, that I essentially left out last time and I sort of regretted not mentioning this. It is so difficult to know what the root cause of that high blood glucose reading was actually caused by because there are so many factors that influence insulin sensitivity and glucose tolerance on a daily basis. One that comes to mind is, and and I'd say this is probably one that not a, people, not a lot of people are aware of and has a significant impact in a very acute short, short amount of time, which is your sleep quality and quantity. There's a study that, that came out, I don't know what year it was, but it was basically looking at a single night of partial sleep deprivation and the impact on insulin resistance in people who are metabolically healthy. Mm-hmm. So if you think about when you look on sort of the fitness industry, Instagram, sort of bro-y, Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, guys wearing CGMs, a lot of them are metabolically healthy. However, when they're having, say, this reading that is a little higher than they want, which is actually, for them, might not be that high considering they're chasing flat lines. Mm -hmm. But when they see this slight elevation, it's very easy to blame food that you ate in that meal that preceded that elevation. Mm -hmm. But not taking into account your sleep quality and quantity the night before. So in this study, looking at a a single night of sleep deprivation, they looked at a four hour sleep from 1 a.m. to 5 a.m., compared it with an eight and a half hour sleep from, I think it was 11 till 7.30. And this was in healthy subjects, not living with with diabetes. Correct. Non-diabetic subjects, metabolically healthy. And it showed that they did have impaired insulin sensitivity or even you could term it insulin resistance and worsened glucose tolerance in the day following that sleepless night. So the problem with CGMs are if you give them to everyone and you don't educate them about the multiple factors that can influence mm-hmm. their, you know, the, the so-called worm that they see in their data on their CGM every day, then how are they supposed to know what, was mm-hmm. the, what the cause was? So for example, I could have a bowl of oats on Monday morning and I haven't slept well. And I'm stressed about the fact I haven't slept well because usually that happens. Yeah. I know if I have a bad night's sleep, thankfully, touch wood, I sleep very well. But yeah. if I don't, which happens to all of us, I that just sends me into a downward spiral. Right. I think about it. I think, gosh, I've really set myself up for yeah. a poor day here. Yeah. Uh, I always say stressing about yeah. a sleepless night is actually worse than the sleepless night. So I sit down to have the, those oats. <laughs> yeah. My blood glucose response would be different to say on Thursday morning, I have the same bowl of oats, I've slept beautifully, I'm not stressed, but I'm eating the exact same meal. Correct. I'd go further to say, what you did in the 24 hours prior to that night's sleep will also impact the oats that you ate that morning. Okay. So Did you go to the gym 24 hours before? Did you do one workout? Did you do two? Did you do cardio? Did you do Mm -hmm. resistance training? So the mode of exercise can increase insulin sensitivity for up to 72 hours. Mm -hmm. So let's say somebody has a CGM and they do their own little self-experiment where they eat a meal, they look at the response, uh, their glucose response to the meal, and they decide it's not a healthy response. It went outside of the normal range. And they think, you know what? I'm just going to cut that food out. I I can't Mm -hmm. eat oats. It's not not on my menu. But they didn't think, how did I sleep the previous night or the previous Mm -hmm. three, four, five nights? How stressed have I been? Did I exercise this week? 
I mean, these variables are very important. You almost need to not write a food off based on one uh, response. That's it. You need to give it a go over different times, weeks, and see with with uh, with all of these other variables uh, fluctuating. That's what's right. your average response look like to that food? Yeah, I would say try to have some patience with this experiment. Don't make decisions based off one reading on one day. Look at the bigger picture, as you just mentioned. Mm -hmm. I will say, though, I can now see, you know, after I went through that study uh, and thought about the utility of CGMs, there may be a potential benefit for shift workers. So people who do work through the night and have mm -hmm. a disrupted circadian rhythm, that actually could be really interesting for shift workers to mm -hmm. wear a CGM and see what their blood glucose response is to certain meals when they're in that Mm. block of shift work that could be something and mm. I'll, I'll i'll uh i'll admit to something on a personal level if i do have a sleepless night i know obviously the next day i know where you're going with this <laughs> low Con carb confession time Car i'm a low carb carnivore yes not carnivore not quite there <laughs> but i'm a low carb plant-based eater mm -hmm. the day after either a sleepless night or a very stressful event or if i'm sick or fighting an infection so in other words any time that i am less glucose tolerant, less insulin sensitive. I do reduce my carbohydrate intake because we do know that carbs can be a trigger of symptoms, symptom being hyperglycemia. So I just listen to my body and understand that if I did eat a lot of carbohydrates on those days where I'm not as insulin sensitive, I'm probably going to have a little bit worse glucose control over the day. Mm -hmm. So I just eat a lower carb diet on those days. And I think it's just, it's a nice tool that you can add in. I don't think I'm actually so sick of the like low carb versus low fat mm -hmm. tribalism. I'm, I'm I'm sick of it because I really think that we just need to see our food as our food, try eat a healthy dietary pattern, and if you really want to get into the sort of more granular level of managing your health, then yeah, you could wear a CGM and you could play around with your carbohydrate mm -hmm. intake depending on the context in which you've slept and It'd be an interesting study with shift workers to look at blood glucose and other outcomes. And have mm. have uh, a low carb intervention, moderate carb, yeah. and uh, and see see if there's any differences there. Well, there is data um, regarding the prevalence of diabetes and pre and pre diabetes and insulin resistance in shift workers. Interesting. And there is a higher uh, incidence of of those conditions in shift mm. workers, which is not surprising. It's really mm. not metabolically when you think about it. It's not surprising. It does. It makes me worry about my sister, who's a doctor, does a lot of shift work. I think about our met metabolic health all the time and it's a hard one because, you know, doctors are doing such an unbelievable job and we need mm. doctors who are doing the shift work. It's such an altruistic way of living, yet, you know, that degree of selflessness might actually harm their, mm. their long-term health. Have it? you looked at your uh, blood glucose control? Let's say you eat a little too close to going to bed as melatonin's gone up and cortisol's come down, my understanding is that insulin sensitivity tends to drop off a bit. Do you, do you see that? Absolutely. And uh, as a result of that, I actually front load my carbohydrates. So I, I try to eat the majority of my car carbohydrates after my morning workout when I'm most insulin mm, sensitive. Like a sponge. I, yeah, you just literally like your muscles are like a sponge, just soak up the glucose from the bloodstream. And as the day progresses and my activity levels obviously decline naturally, not only do I reduce my carbohydrate intake, but I reduce the size of my meals. Mm -hmm. So bigger meals early with more carbohydrates, smaller meals as the day goes on, less and less carbohydrates uh, before bed. I think that's consistent with the, the research out of such and Panda's lab and a few other labs that are looking at meal timing and sort of uh, distribution of calories over a day. Mm. Last question here mm -hmm. to, to really round out the CGM and no doubt we'll come back to this one in, in future uh, conversations because it is an area where there's a lot of research. If folks are listening and just thinking, I'd love to understand outside of eating a healthy diet, what other parts of my lifestyle should I think about to better manage my blood glucose? And, and you've kind of alluded to a few of them, but if you could just summarize them. So what I would say is, being as active as possible over the course of the day has more of an effect on your insulin sensitivity and glucose control than people understand. And there's actually a study that we were going to talk about. I mean, we may as well bring it up in here. But sure. I'll give you that sort of uh, um, zoomed out 
summary and then we can sort of dive mm-hmm. into that study. But physical activity and exercise and, and differentiating between the two. So exercise being somewhat structured, intentional form of, of, of movement where it could be a circuit training, it could be F45, it could be, you know, strength training, resistance training, cardiovascular training, something with a structure and a purpose. Mm-hmm. So you, you've, you've put aside, say, an hour or an hour and a half to doing your exercise every day. Outside of that, physical activity, so incidental stuff like walking to get your groceries, walking your dog, you know, increasing your step count, being on your feet as much as possible. Those two things are a pretty powerful two-punch combo. So I would definitely try to incorporate those into your day. Prioritizing sleep quality and quantity we alluded to the study that before, but there are dozens of other studies that sort of replicate mm-hmm. those results. So that's sleeping for at least eight hours, tr- hopefully unbroken sleep in a cool, quiet, dark room, managing your stress, not eliminating stress because we speak about this all the time, but hormesis being a, you know, a short-term stressor is actually quite important, but more that chronic long-term stress that can actually impair mm-hmm. your glucose tolerance. And the psychological stress. You know, yeah. It's a bit different to physical. That's uh, right. How do, you, how do you manage that? And that's not going to go away. Right. It's always it's, going to be there at some level. Yeah. Uh, so finding finding methods to get around that psychological stress that sort of lingers. I wonder if there's been any studies looking at, you know, five minute breath work interventions and how that would affect someone's yeah. response to a meal. Very. I haven't looked at that, but that, that could be really interesting. And the cool thing is I can actually probably test that on myself every now and then. Okay. Yeah. Having a CGM. You go away and do that and then and report That's my back. homework. Okay. And that's an N equals one uh, anecdote. So uh, I'm sure all of the... Uh, Carnival community, anyway, <laughs> we'll uh, we'll treat that as uh, the gold standard. <laughs> yeah, we're not going to put too much weight on it, but the N equals one. It's interesting. It's hypothesis generating. We'll call it that. That was a bit cheeky. It was cheeky. Sorry, right? No jabs there. All right. So we're talk- so sleep and stress. Manage those physical activity, and exercise, and the last one I would say is t- to do with nutrition is limiting your saturated fat intake, especially if you're combining nutrients in meals. Mm. So if you have a high fat, high carb meal, that is a cocktail for Mm. a little bit of difficulty. In saying that, as you've probably seen online, there is a, I'm not going to name the person, but there's a person online who wears a CGM and posts a lot about nutrition. Um, And this particular person compares a food, a carbohydrate food on its own to a carbohydrate food combined with fat, say, let's just, for example, say a piece of sourdough toast on its own. And then the next time that this person eats it, it would be a piece of sourdough with avocado. And the addition of fat to that carbohydrate can slow the uptake of glucose into the bloodstream, Mm -hmm. right? So combining fat and carbohydrate can slow down that glucose absorption However, if you're eating a high amount of saturated fat and a high glycemic load together, so picture- The Western diet. The Western diet, think about a pizza, right? Refined carbohydrate, hundreds of grams of carbohydrate in a refined form. Lots of fat from cheese, the cheese. Yeah, saturated fat. That particular meal is asking for trouble. Mm-hmm. And you see this in people with type one all the time across the board. The two hardest meals to eat are a pizza, like a cheesy fatty pizza and or a big bowl of pasta with like a fatty, cheesy, meaty sauce. Those two what meals, a burger with a, with probably a similar. The, the, the difference there is a burger only gives you about 30 grams of carbohydrate in the bun, mm. whilst a bowl of pasta or pizza, you, you're talking okay. 75 to 100 grams or more. Mm-hmm. So it's the high glycemic load, high saturated fat combination is like a metabolic- So burgers, we can just eat them all day, every day then based on that. <laughs> Is that, is that the takeaway? Calm down, Bear Grylls. That's not the takeaway, okay? <laughs> Keep Com- it together. Compared to what? Pizza. <laughs> compared to what? Exactly. <laughs> yeah, so so I would say avoiding, well, not avoiding those foods altogether, but understanding the metabolic cost of those foods. If you're okay. going to eat foods that are mm. pizza or pasta-like, you can expect some, some difficulties. Mm. And interestingly, I had a few hurdles early on when I was diagnosed where I would eat a, you know, I was, I was 22 years old. I didn't know the effect of a bowl of pasta on, on mm. my blood glucose. I'd just been diagnosed with diabetes and I ate a bowl of pasta and I checked my blood glucose an hour later and it was like perfectly normal. I was like, this is easy. Diabetes mm. is so easy. I just nailed it. My first time trying this meal with diabetes. Two hours later, I was fine. Two and a half, still good. Three hours later, I'm getting ready for bed, check my blood glucose. I'm in the normal range. Everything's fine. Six hours later, six hours after the meal, my blood glucose spiked so high and it would be 
if if you didn't understand the the sort of mm. physiology, so what do you of what, put that how, down to? Insulin resistance at the liver? No, actually. So the, the spike that that occurs six hours after eating, say, a bowl of pasta, is to do with the high glycemic load, the very slow absorption of glucose into the bloodstream because it's inhibited by the mm -hmm. large amount of saturated fat that it was packed with. So when the insulin that I injected went out of my system, gotcha. Then my meal was digested late. So I had this slow rising glucose drip feeding into the bloodstream overnight across five, six hours, by which point my insulin had already gone out of the system. So I had no hormone there to be the key to allow it to go through the gate into the mm -hmm. muscle cells. So it's, it's, again, it's one of those things where this can happen. This can actually happen in people without diabetes. I, I remember seeing an experiment that this guy did. It was an N equals one. He was wearing a CGM. He was a paleo uh, guy. It's on YouTube. Anyone can find it. He goes to a vegan restaurant, eats a really high fat, high carb meal to sort of prove that mm -hmm. it's an issue. He was very surprised to see that two hours after his meal, his blood glucose was fine. And he was, he was going out there trying to attack carbohydrates. Like his agenda was prove that carbohydrates are bad for glucose metabolism. Mm -hmm. He was fine two hours later, but five, six hours later, he had a spike and he produces his own, his own insulin. Mm. And then he, he just obviously went to town on carbs being these terrible things that slowly and but he didn't realize again this goes back this is a perfect example of somebody wearing cgm who's uneducated about what actually happened there he didn't realize that the junky fried food that he ate in combination with the carbohydrates was the, what impaired the glucose tolerance mm -hmm. so he blamed the carbohydrate but i i mean it would be more responsible to blame the deep fried sure. way that it was cooked mm -hmm. Because that carb on its own would not have had a six hour delayed spike if it wasn't deep fried. Mm. Yeah, I'm, I mean, we see that that oversimplification of blaming carbohydrates irrespective of the source, mm. which we know is the most important thing. Yeah. Where are you getting those carbohydrates from? You know, you, you, you mentioned there those blood glucose curves on social media and uh, there are a few people that sort of post those. But the more I think about that, again, uh, there's only so much you can kind of take away from those. I think some of them where it shows, you know, the addition of say vinegar and that helps with a- Apple a, cider vinegar. <laughs> yeah. I think some of that's interesting, but back to our earlier points, if you look at someone else's blood glucose response to a meal, what you're not seeing other than the time and perhaps the ingredients in the meal is how stressed they are, mm -hmm. how much exercise did they do in the day before, exactly. how did they sleep, all of these other variables it's so that affected hard. that curve. Exactly. So hard to control for all that. Mm -hmm. Do you know something I learned about insulin? Tell me. Uh, so insulin used to be, I believe, was sourced from baby cows. Mm -hmm. Have you heard that? And pigs, yes. And pigs. And so it was a, a byproduct of the, the veal industry, I believe. Um, and today though, insulin is actually produced through what's called precision fermentation. So it's animal free. Mm -hmm. And that same technology is currently being used, and I just interviewed a guy, by uh, many companies across the world to create animal free dairy. Mm. So animal free cow's milk, animal free yogurt, animal free oh. cheese, bio identical using the exact same technology that used to be used, uh, sorry, that is used today to produce insulin. Wow, that is, that's amazing. Um, because I know that it used to be extracted from pig's pancreas. Mm -hmm. And I was always uncomfortable about that in terms of injecting something that my body would recognize as maybe from another animal. I, I'm not sure of, of the um, actual like makeup of the molecule of insulin, whether or not the body understands that that's from a pig or a human. But now the one I use called Humalog is derived from human cells. But that's really mm -hmm. cool to know that you can do it without needing to uh, go through the animal mm -hmm. and, and that it's the same pathway that they're using for the dairy and, and everything else. That's, yeah, it's awesome. I love it. Okay, maybe we should have a, a, a very quick can I, can break. Can I add one thing in before the break? Is your bladder going to hold on? Are you good? Yes, do it. Give me two I was minutes. actually going to call a break so we could get some chocolate. but <laughs> <laughs> Okay, we'll do, let's do both. Let me get this out of the way quickly while we're on the topic of insulin. So the current situation now uh, in the Ukraine is that supplies of insulin are actually running very, very low. And Gosh. I was thinking as someone with type 1 diabetes, how... That's scary. Oh, mate. It is so frightening. Insulin is literally the hormone that keeps us alive. Mm -hmm. well, All people, human beings. People used to die of type 1 diabetes, right? Oh, it was a death sentence. 100 years ago, before insulin was even invented, death sentence. Mm -hmm. And the management strategy 
was a starvation diet. It was less than maybe mm. 500 calories just a day. Get, just keep blood glucose right down. Keep it down so that you can keep your ketones down. Because mm -hmm. if you enter ketoacidosis, sure. you're gone. You're, it's coma and death pretty quickly. I mean, we're talking weeks here. So if I, like for somebody like myself, if I was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes 100 years ago, mm. you've got weeks or months to live. You're, you're on a starvation diet. It's the quality of life is, is just, mm. I wouldn't even call it life or living. You're, you're just surviving. You're just holding on. And interestingly, the first insulin that was um, derived was actually from a dog. So dogs, man's best friend, really are man's mm -hmm. best friend. They, they, they were what sort of allowed these scientists to figure out that they could extract it from a dog and keep human beings alive. Fast forward 100 years, and you would think that, and, and we are living a fantastic life. Not only now are we surviving or holding on, we are th literally thriving, having an amazing quality of life. But then you think about what happens in the world where, where, say, a war like what's happening in Ukraine can get in the way of getting these life-saving supplies to people with diabetes. And there's about 100,000, I believe, type 1s in Ukraine who are lacking supplies. In some parts of Ukraine, they only had like three weeks of supplies left within that, that region. Can you imagine how scary that would be if you're living with type 1 thinking, if I don't get my insulin in the next three, four weeks... This could be it. I wonder if there's a way that we can support through a charity or something that we can if we can put in the show notes and get well, the community behind there. Well, I mean, I've, I've just completely messed up our order of, of the podcast, but my good news of the week was that okay. there is a, uh, a cause where you can donate mm -hmm. and they're making supplies accessible. What's and getting that called? Into. So the one that I found was called Beyond Type 1. Okay. Uh, they're a global organization, I believe, who are – just doing great things with other diabetes organizations. It's kind of like all the organizations came together and understood that this is a big problem. Right. We need to get supplies and uh, insulin to these people as soon as we mm -hmm. can. And they're doing what whatever they can to do so. And essentially as, as an individual listening, if you want to help, it's basically a donation mm -hmm. where, where I, 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 there is also, I, w I will say there is another platform where you can actually send supplies, which would feel amazing, but there's issues with that. So insulin needs to be at a certain temperature. Sure. So maybe not insulin, but you could send other supplies like glucose test strips or Lancets or the, the management devices around diabetes, but not necessarily mm -hmm. the insulin itself because it's so mm -hmm. fragile to transport. But yeah, I mean, my good news of the week to skip ahead, I'm sorry to screw the order up, but it just came out, is that we can do something to actually help people with diabetes who are lacking supplies of insulin who otherwise might literally not survive with, without it. So mm -hmm. Beyond Type 1 and other organizations, thank you so much for all your good work. Yeah, I think that's a, a really important uh, message and there is no order to this show, by the way. That's the whole point. Yeah. Uh, but we'll we'll put the link to that into the show notes and and I'd also like just to quickly mention Danielle Bellato I've seen, who's a cardiologist in the States. She's actually over, I think, on the border helping on the ground oh, wow. um, as a doctor. So wow. it's really uh, incredible to see people from around the world coming together to, to help during this crisis it and of is. course there are so many people like those with type 1 diabetes that are living through this nightmare also at the same time experiencing poor health there's no doubt mm. there's children with cancer and their right. their treatments are being affected so um, there's a lot of sad stories but uh, of course um, thank thankfully with various organizations uh, help and, and being on the ground we can contribute in, in at least some way so Hey friends, I hope you're enjoying this episode so far. A quick message from one of our sponsors who makes this show possible, and then we'll jump straight back into things. If you're familiar with my nutrition philosophy, you will know that I'm a huge believer in plant-rich diets being better for people and our planet. You'll also know that I frequently draw attention to what I describe as nutrients of focus. These are nutrients that science shows plant-based eaters, whether plant predominant or exclusive, can fall short in, which can leave you feeling run down, lacking energy, experiencing brain fog, and generally just not as vital as you'd like to be. For that reason, together with Emil, a plant-based health and wellness company, I formulated Essential 8. Essential 8 is your one-stop multinutrient, formulated with DHA, EPA, Omega-3s from algae oil, vitamin B12, iodine, vitamin D3, iron, zinc, selenium, and calcium to perfectly complement your plant-rich diet. I personally take Essential 8 every morning with breakfast, just two capsules, much easier than supplementing with these eight key nutrients individually. 
What's even more convenient is I have a monthly subscription, so it turns up automatically on my doorstep and I never miss a beat. To get yours, head to theproof.com forward slash friends. That's theproof.com forward slash friends, where you'll find a link to purchase Essential 8 that will get you an extra 5% off your first order on top of the significant subscription discount. There will also be a link to this in the show notes. Okay, back to the show. We're armed with chocolate here. Actually, there's a, a, a story look. about this chocolate. Talk to me. So I received a parcel in the mail and <laughs> it was a quite a large parcel and I opened it up and, and someone had printed out their entire book for me on A4 paper. Mm-hmm. And there was a, a cover letter uh, and asking me to blurb the, the book and I don't blurb books unless I read the entire thing. I think it's the only way to to kind of put your name to, to something is having read through the entire thing, which oddly is not the way that the kind of blurb game works uh, out there. There's a lot of trading, write my blurb, I'll write yours and a lot of mm. not reading books um, yeah. I've learned. So uh, I... Unfortunately, I, I won't have the time to get through this entire book. Uh, I'm sure that a lot of uh, love has gone into writing it, a lot of hard work. Mm. I know what it's like to, to write a book. So um, thank you for, for sending that. It came from a guy called Steve. And so we, we're eating uh, lollies or candy here from a stranger. Uh, it could be anything. It could True. Be, I mean, it could be Paul Saladino could have sent this. We'll, we'll, we'll find out in the next hour. Um, how yeah. we go. Thanks for the chocolate, Steve. Appreciate it. I just had the, uh, what was it? Yeah. So the, the, the chocolate was hidden in the, in the middle of the, uh, of the kind of pile of, of uh, paper there. So it was a very sweet gesture. Or he was gesture. testing you to see if you get to halfway through the book, mm. you get rewarded with the chocolate. I realized it was hollow straight away. And okay. You, went, you skipped to the good stuff. I went straight to the chocolate. No delayed gratification from you, mate. Straight no. to the gold. Thank you, Steve. Thanks, Steve. Uh, speaking of chocolate, mm-hmm. there has been a couple of studies over the past week. Uh, these are sort of February, uh, March uh, studies that were published in February and March this year, 2022, um, that I thought would be interesting to kind of share because chocolate is, uh, it's a very interesting food. Mm. There are some some properties within chocolate that have been studied uh, for decades and and seem to have a favorable effect on our physiology, particularly the polyphenols, uh, a group of polyphenols called flavanols, which uh, seem to really have a beneficial effect on our on our cardiovascular system, mm-hmm. the function of our arteries, um, and also things like inflammation. So there was what is one of the biggest randomized controlled trials that I can remember in, in recent times called the COSMOS study. Mm-hmm. It's a great name. And that stands for cocoa or cocoa. How do you say it? I say cocoa. Okay. I'm going to roll with cocoa because well, there, co- there is an A on the end of it. And cacao? Uh, that's different. That's different. Okay. So this is cocoa. Cocoa. Cocoa supplement and multivitamin outcomes study. And the abbreviation for that was COSMOS. Pretty clever. Clever. Uh, this was published in the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition, which is a one of the leading journals. Um, and it included 21,000 men and women aged 60 or over. Are you surprised when the, when the scientists go, hey, who wants to be part of a chocolate study? 21,000 people put their hand up. <laughs> yeah, well... <laughs> In fairness, it wasn't actually, you didn't get to eat chocolate. So let me get there. Uh, there was oh, a five-year no. five year randomized controlled trial. Mm-hmm. So big money to, to do this. Uh, double-blind placebo-controlled study. Um, they were randomized, these 21,000 participants, to daily capsules that contained 500 milligrams of cocoa flavanols. Okay. So just remember that because we need to come back to that. Okay. 500 milligrams of cocoa flavanols, and that is the polyphenols. So they had gotcha. a very concentrated form of these polyphenols that you would find in chocolate. Okay. Others were randomized to a multivitamin tablet group. Some were randomized to neither, 
and others to both. They okay. received the cocoa flavanols and the multivitamin. Okay. Now, there were some very interesting findings from this study, and I won't go into all of the different outcomes, but one of the most interesting and what was reported on was a 27% reduction in deaths from cardiovascular disease in the group that were supplementing with the cocoa polyphenols. Mm. That's, that's Big number. very, very significant and super interesting given we're talking about the number one leading cause of, of death and something as simple as supplementing 500 milligrams of these cocoa flavanols had such a significant effect. Mm. Uh, now, I ran the maths on this because I was curious. People listening might think, okay, 500 milligrams of cocoa flavanols, how much chocolate would I need to eat mm -hmm. to get that much? And it seems to vary. And the reason it, it seems to vary is because some chocolate is like 50% cocoa, some is 70%, some is 80%, some is 90%. Right. And so there is some variability out there. But across the board, what I could see was in 100 grams of chocolate, you get about 100 milligrams of cocoa flavanols. Okay. So you would need to eat 500 grams of chocolate, <laughs> give or take. Yeah. It, someone might correct me. It might be 450. It might be 600 grams. Yeah. Either way, a standard, uh, you know, the, the bars of chocolate that we, that we tend to get, the super dark ones? Yeah. They're about 80 grams for that big sort of eight, eight squares mm. is about 80 grams. Mm. So we're talking what five, six, seven, seven of those, yeah. of those uh, which is a large amount of calories yeah. on a daily basis <laughs> coming from chocolate. So I think straight away we can rule out the idea of trying to achieve this uh, cocoa flavanol intake through chocolate, chocolate alone. Yeah. Um, and the researchers also did various press conferences and they definitely – certainly mentioned that mm. and said that this will now be uh, precedence for future studies to, to look further at. Uh, hopefully, they do 500 milligrams versus 300 and 200 right. and, and start to see what's the minimum effective volume yep. Yep. Uh, of daily flavanol intake mm. that can have a positive effect on cardiovascular uh, health. Interesting. Can I ask you a question? Why do you think that the group taking both – didn't see significant outcomes the same as the group just taking the 500 milligram flavanol capsule. So the multivitamin group mm -hmm. who also took the 500 milligrams of flavanols, did they see a significant improvement in cardiovascular outcomes as I well? I think that everyone that was taking the cocoa flavanols saw the benefit. Okay. What, what There was no extra benefit in the group that was taking the cocoa flavanols plus, plus. the multivitamin. Gotcha. And in the group that was just taking the multivitamin, there was no benefit at all. Wow. Now, that's not to say that multivitamins aren't important. It might be that just having a multivitamin for three or four years in that duration doesn't have an effect, particularly on the, say, a background diet that already was providing right. the required uh, vitamins and, and minerals. Yeah. So uh, I'm not sure that this trial suggests that stop taking a multi and just go and yeah. take some cocoa powder. Yeah. Um, and, and I think the other thing I'd remind people here is it, this was 500 milligrams of cocoa flavanols, not 500 milligrams of cocoa powder. Okay. So this is a very concentrated form of polyphenols that was delivered in this study. Yep, makes sense. Uh, and, and this kind of reminds me of red wine and resveratrol. Yeah. <laughs> because it's a similar story there where uh, to consume this sort of uh, amount of resveratrol that has been shown in animal studies at least to have health benefits if you were trying to access that through wine alone mm -hmm. i think there's various reports out there but some you know it's it's like it could be six bottles a day it could be 10 bottles a day uh, the point being that similar to this scenario you're not going to try and get these cocoa flavanols or that amount through eating chocolate yeah uh and I did have another study, interestingly, it's the, the month of, of cocoa and chocolate and, and research, interesting research. Uh, there was another study that I thought was worth sharing. And then we can kind of, I guess, tie off on what do we think is the optimal amount of chocolate or dark chocolate yep. to eat a day. Mm -hmm. uh, this one, this study uh, 
was again a randomized controlled trial. They were really looking at dark chocolate specifically and how it affects, modulates the gut microbiome and also mood, mm. which I think is really interesting because we know there is this direct uh, and indirect connection between the gut and the central nervous system. Uh, some of this through hormones, some of this through direct nerve uh, connections like vagus nerve. Um, and they randomized uh, people into three groups, 85% dark chocolate group, 70% dark chocolate group, and a control group. Mm -hmm. Control group were given nothing. The other two groups were given 30 grams of dark chocolate per day, 70% in one group, 85% in the other group. 30 grams, that sounds 30 grams is about, small. yes, it's about, uh, you know, the standard size squares yeah. of uh, that super dark chocolate we eat. It's about one and a half of those. Interesting. See this, see this one here? Half a bar. So half of this mm -hmm. entire bar is apparently- One serve. Uh, yeah, 25 grams. Yeah. So that's essentially- Usually a serve is about 25 or 30 grams right. on most chocolate. I mean, this is a small bar of chocolate. Yeah. But to think you have to eat half But it's half a damn good that, bar. Thank you, Steve. <laughs> it is. But what I'm saying is like in, in this particular uh, um, study you're talking mm -hmm. about, they were eating, yeah, like, you know, a good amount. It's mm -hmm. not like a, people think it's just one, like one square. Like it still mm -hmm. is a couple of squares there. It's enough chocolate. Yeah. Well, it's damn good for now. I'm not sure. It depends on it. If, if there's a slow release poison in there, <laughs> then we might not finish this episode. Um, but back to this study. So the randomization was really solid. There was no significant differences between the subjects once they were randomized. If we're looking at things like their height and uh, body weight, uh, et cetera. Uh, they, the 85% dark chocolate group that 30 gram serve had about 400 milligrams of cocoa polyphenols, right? That seems very high to me. Mm. I'm not sure how they achieved that. Um, Cause that's close to that number from the previous yeah. study, right? So I'm not sure how they achieved that, but that doesn't seem achievable in real life scenario. Interesting. Um, what they saw was significant increase in micro microbial diversity in the 85% group and better mood compared to the control but they didn't see that in the 70% group. Very interesting. And their hypothesis was that perhaps it takes a certain amount of polyphenols in order to have a therapeutic effect mm. and modulate the microbiome enough to result in a, a change in someone's mood state. Uh, can, I, can I point something out here quickly? So the 500 milligrams of isoflavones from the previous study compared to 400 milligrams mm -hmm. of cocoa polyphenols. Mm -hmm. What is the difference between polyphenols and isoflavones? Is, is an isoflavone a polyphenol? A flavanol, flavanol. which cocoa, the cocoa flavanols, what which we say? used in, in, co in the Cosmos study, yep. that is a class of polyphenols. Right, so they concentrated one class of One class. Okay, right, which so was mainly like underneath that class, then you have catechins, it, it branches out and goes into many different uh, flavanols. Right. And then in this other study, and this is a, a good point, it's not it's not exactly apples for apples right. because this was cocoa polyphenols. The umbrella term. Umbrella term. Gotcha. And that might, that might explain why there was a higher concentration of these in a small dose of chocolate. Yeah. Right. So if, um, you, if we zoomed in on that particular dose of chocolate and looked at the flavanols, it probably wasn't close to 500 milligrams. Yeah. Okay. Depending if they made their own chocolate or this was chocolate that you can just buy, okay. which I, I'm not sure. We'd have to go back in and look at that. Um, now, the the sort of take-home message from that was that the 85% dark chocolate group did tend to have a uh, significant benefit compared to control, but the 70% dark chocolate did not. Oh. And maybe we will go back into the methods of that after this and I can put it into the, to the outro yeah. to give people an idea as to is that 85% dark chocolate representative of something you can just buy off the shelf right. or was this something that they formulated and made for the study because I think that's an important. Very interesting. Um, and then I think just sort of zooming out to the point that I made about where does this leave us in terms of if you're going to eat chocolate, like, okay, we, we've established that there might be some benefits, but like many things, more is not always better, mm -hmm. right? And there is a really big meta-analysis that was done looking at the risk of cardiovascular disease with intake of chocolate. Mm -hmm. And what it showed, and uh, I'll, I'll tell you what it showed from a, a, a volume 
per week and then we can kind of try and make sense of why. They showed that 45 grams, just 45 grams a week mm. was associated with the lowest risk of cardiovascular disease. And once you went above 45 grams, it started to go up. Now, here's the thing. I went into that and, and looked at, did they consider the type of chocolate people were eating? This was just chocolate overall. Yep. So there was no breakdown of dairy. There was no breakdown of low cocoa versus dark chocolate, right. Sugar et cetera. Content, right? yeah. And we know that if you're, you know, if you're consuming your, your cocoa flavanols, presumably in a blend where there's a lot of added sugars right. and stuff, then you might be offsetting some of that benefit. Right. So I think w without having a meta-analysis, just looking at dark chocolate, I think it would be safe to presume that dark chocolate would be superior in terms of benefits than, say, a, a chocolate that has a lower percentage of cocoa and has added sugars. Mm. Um, so 45, I, 45 grams a week. That's a small amount yeah. when, when you think about it. One of those bars, those yeah. super dark bars, is about 80 grams a week. Okay. And or 70 to 80 grams a week, which works out to be about one to two squares a day. Okay. And I think in the absence of any more evidence, that's probably a good kind of rule of thumb of A, try and go for something that's like 85%, 90, 90 95%, yep. and trying to keep it to maximum of sort of 80 grams a week. Yeah. I think until there is better evidence is probably quite a sensible uh, idea. I know that's easier said than done. I know myself personally, some nights I'll have a couple <laughs> of pieces and then all of a sudden I feel like another four. Yeah. Um, and and the other thing I'd add there is that I, I know people that just don't like dark chocolate, Yeah. but I think you need to give it some time. Yeah, I think it's an acquired taste. Your palate will change as mm -hmm. you eat it more often. I actually follow these these guidelines perfectly just by fluke I, I eat one to two squares a day carly always laughs at me because the way i eat my chocolate i'm so mindful because i know i've given myself an allocation of mm -hmm. one square a day or max two so when i eat that square it's like it's the last mm -hmm. square of dark chocolate on earth fully mindful and present i don't mm -hmm. do anything else while i'm doing it. i just eat it and enjoy it and i think that that's probably a good lesson for all of our meals i think most people probably eat very mindlessly and don't connect with what they're eating mm -hmm. and i think that if you give yourself an allocation like this particular study is showing that 45 grams a week enjoy it get the benefit you don't have to just mm -hmm. mindlessly put it away like you would popcorn during mm -hmm. a movie i think that's especially yeah. with the calorie I think density that it. that sort of just principle that you have there is is the compromise between complete restriction and just eat whatever you want whenever you want right in the middle what you're speaking to is this idea of it's not complete restriction, but it's a structure. Yeah, There's some structure there yeah. that allows you to uh, stay consistent yeah. and consume that food in a healthy manner. Yeah, and if, if I did go over my allocation, I wouldn't be mad at myself about it. I, I just understand that that's all I actually need mm -hmm. for, for the purpose that that food plays in, in my daily uh, dietary pattern. That's all I need and I can enjoy it mm -hmm. in that moment. And I, if I do go over it, that's fine, but I'm certainly staying as mindful as possible. Mm -hmm. Just get back on track the next day. Yeah. Okay, I thought we would also talk about steps here and then mm -hmm. I'll hand over the baton to you to, cool. to talk about uh, a few studies that you wanted to share. So this one I thought was interesting because I'm sure you've heard before, get 10,000 steps a day. Yeah. And the origin of that message is very interesting because it actually comes from a, a, a marketing campaign I think a Japanese brand that was bringing out a, a step counter. Mm -hmm. And so it wasn't that there was this definitive type of research that was able to show that 10,000 steps a day is the absolute best mm -hmm. and, and sort of optimal. Uh, and I think a lot of people intuitively kind of understand that, but it was nice to see a meta-analysis of seven large perspective um, studies. And these were large cohorts where they were looking at uh, rates of death and also how many steps people were doing. Mm. And all of the individuals in these uh, various cohorts had step trackers of some description. And there was some interesting findings in here that I want to share with people and you can kind of um, take it uh, or leave it and, and sort of use it within your lifestyle, whatever makes sense. 
I think something that was really interesting was there was significant benefit all the way from once you got over 2,000 steps, 2,700 steps a day, Mm -hmm. all the way to 16,000, there was continued benefit. Mm -hmm. It's not like you got to 10,000 and the benefit just stopped. (laughs) Okay. So that was the first thing I want to say. However, the largest benefit is seen in the first 8,000 steps. So you had a, compared to 2,700 steps, if you were walking 8,000 steps, you had a 48% relative reduction, relative risk reduction in total mortality, premature death. The benefit does continue after 8,000 steps, but it's not like going from 8,000 to 16,000 gives you double the benefit. Right. It starts to slow down and diminish. You, your returns diminish a bit yeah. as you get over that 8,000 steps um, sort of uh, level. And I think yeah. there was another, there was one study that has been um, spoken about quite a bit. Uh, I think Harvard wrote something on it. It was a single study that showed that at 7,500 steps, there was no extra benefit. Mm. And uh, what I want to to kind of just remind people here is that in this scenario, the stronger, more reliable evidence is the meta-analysis. And it actually did include that paper. It included that plus another six prospective cohorts. And then they were able to look at that curve and see that there was continued benefit all the way to 16,000. And importantly, all of those studies controlled for body weight. Right. Um, Yeah, it's really interesting how marketing infiltrates common society. mm -hmm. Like that 10,000 number is a figure... Everyone, you ask anyone, what is your step count goal? Everyone just says 10,000. And look, if you're doing 10,000, I think that's awesome. It's great. It's so good. It's uh, clearly there's a big risk reduction in risk of mortality if you're doing 10,000 over 2,700. Sure. But I think that capping it at 10,000, because a lot of people will hit that number and then sort of take their foot off the gas Mm -hmm. and say, oh, well, I've hit my 10,000 for the day. I can kick my feet up and then sort of sit on my ass all day, Mm -hmm. which you can if you want. But interestingly, which flows on nicely here, is the study that I brought in, which was comparing. I'll just take a step back for a second. Often what's happened with with myself is because I live with type 1 diabetes, diabetes is like my greatest teacher. It's it's exposing me to all of these lifestyle factors that are influencing my glucose control over the day and insulin requirements. So I tend to find these, these factors that sort of pop up and I go, you know what? That's really interesting. Today I've, I've been sitting down a lot. My blood glucose is way worse than say yesterday when I was on my feet a lot, which then leads me to look into the to research and find studies that either can support or, or not support this hypothesis that I've sort of come up with. And I found this study, which is backed by many other ones very similar, which was looking at minimal intensity physical activity. So standing and walking for long durations and comparing it to sedentary lifestyle Mm -hmm. as well as a sedentary lifestyle with say one vigorous workout a day okay so practically speaking that's uh let's say person a is doing their ten thousand steps sort of evenly distributed across the day right versus someone who is sitting down all day at their desk yep and then after work goes and and does a a workout and in that does 10,000 steps within that single hour exactly right so in this particular study that they looked at three groups so there was a sitting group who sat down for 14 hours of the day. That's a lot. That's a lot. Like think about our day. We have 24 hours. If you're following the sleep guidelines, you want to be sleeping for about eight. So we've got 16 waking hours left over. What you do with those 16 hours, as you're about to see, mm-hmm. is really important. So those, the way in which you distribute your activity across 16 hours will significantly influence your obviously your overall health. But in this particular study – your diabetes health, if you're someone mm-hmm. with diabetes or, or metabolic syndrome or if you're interested at all in your insulin sensitivity or glucose tolerance. So the question is, do you need to be sort of continuously active at some level or can you hack your way, sort of uh, attenuate the downsides of sitting down all day exactly. by doing just one short burst? Exactly. The, I guess the question they were trying to answer is, is one hour of vigorous physical activity or exercise, is that an, a way to offset the negative effects of long periods of sitting. Mm-hmm. So they had a sitting group for 14 hours. They had an exercise group, which was, I found this so interesting, 13 hours of sitting and one hour of vigorous exercise. Mm-hmm. And the last group was the low intensity physical activity group where they offset six hours of sitting with six hours of walking and standing. 
the walking was four hours and the standing was two hours. Mm -hmm. So they, I mean, the way I see this is the fact that they've even decided to split that group into four hours of walking and two hours of standing shows me that they even hypothesized that simply being on your feet and not sitting can offset some of the negative effects of sitting, just standing. So if you have a standing desk in your office mm -hmm. or if you, you know, when you pick up the phone, maybe you get up on your feet and you sort of pace when you talk on the phone, mm -hmm. will that- What will about that, a treadmill desk? Tre there's there's the treadmill desks, there's cycling desks. There are the little pedals you put on the floor. So right now you and yeah, I, we should laughing, do this. but these are good strategies. I oh, made this is fantastic. Mm -hmm. I'm actually going to introduce this to this podcast studio. Imagine okay. if under our desk right now, we had two little pedals. Mm -hmm. And we have to see who goes further. <laughs> <laughs> you always got to gamify it. I love it. Um, so anyway, they looked at these three different groups and what they found was, and this is sort of the conclusion of the study. I'll, I'll kind of read it out and we can unpack it. One, one hour of daily physical activity, physical exercise, cannot compensate for the negative effects of inactivity on insulin level and plasma lipids if the rest of the day is spent sitting. So that vigorous exercise group who did the one hour of hard exercise could not counter out, could counteract the negative effects of sitting for long periods of time. Reducing inactivity by increasing the time spent walking or standing is more effective than one hour of physical activity when energy expenditure is kept constant. So the group that stood for two hours and walked for four, which offset six hours of sitting, had better outcomes for insulin, insulin levels mm -hmm. and plasma lipids than the group who did a hard workout for an hour and sat for 13 hours with the same energy expenditure. So the takeaway here is that- Try and do both. Absolutely try and do both. But let's say for whatever reason, you can't do both. Mm -hmm. Spreading your activity across the day is probably better than putting in one hard hour and then sitting sure. all day. Let's think about this practically though. There's probably uh, many folks listening who, who get to work Mm -hmm. and maybe they start at 9 a.m. It is a desk job. Yep. And they do leave there at, say, 4 or 5 p.m. Mm -hmm. They have a short window of time before dinner with the family, and so they throw their work out in at, say, 5, 6. That's when they go hard and do their hard for an hour. Yep. So what you're saying is that that hard burst 5 to 6, keep that. There's nothing wrong Better with that at all. Yep. That's going to help partly attenuate some of the the the, the I don't want to say damage, but Just the negative effects, the of, negative sitting. effects of, of sitting down all day. I think most of us can kind of appreciate that. That's sure. not great for our physiology. Um, but then where, from what I'm hearing, the real upside and the wins seem to be how can you incorporate various uh, strategies into that nine to five that allow you to continue to work and be productive for your employer or your business if you own it, but allow you to get some of these metabolic benefits. Yeah. Exactly right. So what I would say is, firstly, start your day with a morning routine that allows you to actually get some steps in and some phys physical activity before the sedentary lifestyle takes over for those eight hours. Because mm -hmm. it is very difficult to, to accumulate physical activity when you are working in an office, especially a big office. I mean, it's kind of a little strange to see the guy in the corner just like doing squat jumps next to his desk. Do you know what I mean? So I would accumulate that physical mm -hmm. activity early. We need to get past that. We need to normalize it. So we I, do need a normal. I think though. one of the the strategies there. So, um, I think your your point on getting some steps in early is great, but that sort of uh, embarrassment, right? Yeah. <laughs> I think if you're listening and you are in charge of culture, or you're one of the more senior members, wouldn't it be great to to try and change that culture, yeah. where whether it's the sit to stand or yep. uh, the pedals yep. or standing desks yep. was actually something that was promoted. Absolutely. Standing desks desks have uh, become very mainstream in many offices. It's not sort of embarrassing to be the guy with the standing mm. desk. Um, for some people, it's a badge of honor in a mm. way to be the one who stood up you know, a few hours. But what I would say is sort of sandwich your day with activity. So start it off, healthy morning routine, mm. get a lot of steps in, maybe some time in nature, maybe a structured workout early. What about the standing treadmill though? Is that too far? Well, what, what would you think if you were sitting at the office and some bloke's sweating next I'd to you? I'd probably be I'd envious. I'd be cheering him, yeah. I'd, I'd be, be envious and I'd be asking the boss for the same. Yeah. And I bet you employees across the board would mm -hmm. look at that and go, you know what, let's not. Do let's, you know what I'd like it. to see? Yeah, what? I, I would like to see when you stand versus sit and when you stand and walk on a treadmill, stationary mm. treadmill, what happens to your productivity? Mm. I would bet it would go up. 
because just the mood enhancement mm. of, you know, you know, we know what it's the like. Blood when, flow. Blood flow. When you finish a workout, you feel great. It's much easier, in my opinion, to be productive after a workout, um, which is why I even mm. use my workout as almost a, a primer for when I need to be sharp. Mm -hmm. Like before this podcast, I, I just had to get a session in the gym. Mm. If I came here without exercise, What did you train today? I did legs. I did a heavy okay. leg day. Um, we might have to go into your uh, programming. Yeah, in well, a we've, we've got a study yeah, to talk about here as well. But yeah, just to round this one out. So I would say get that early morning routine. Throughout the day, you can use what I like to say, like little exercise snacks. Mm. So little bite sized movement snacks. Mm -hmm. So you could just do sit to stands where you stand up from your chair and sit back down 20, 30 times. It's like one minute or two minutes spent exercising. Or if your chair has arms, you can do little like bench uh, chair dips. Um, you know, 30 seconds of those, even that is better than nothing. So little exercise snacks. I think that some of that's going to come with a bit of banter. Oh, for sure. In when Australia you, anyway. Oh, if you 100%. start whipping out the dips, dips. on your, uh, your your work <laughs> chair for the first time, <laughs> depending on your yeah. office scenario, I think there yeah. could be there could be a bit of banter, but if you, if you keep it lighthearted, yeah. you might be able to make it work. Yeah, but in particular, in the, in the current climate of, uh, you know, COVID working from home, these mm. tips are very practical. You can do this at home with no one watching yeah. and, and get some benefit from it. The other ones take a phone call and go for a walk. Yeah, walk and talk. I, I love that one. I think just as soon as you have to do anything on the phone where you can be on your feet, at least get on your feet, pace around the room. I mean, mm -hmm. you, you were telling me. <laughs> yeah, I used to pace. Uh, so I uh, actually didn't study very hard until year 11 in, in high school. Uh, and if my parents are listening, they'll be well aware of that. Uh, I used to um, not cause a bit of trouble, but I was uh, very focused on sport and not so much the academic side of things. And uh, I had a lot of time on my hands because of that. And then in year 11, 12, I decided I'd better apply myself. My uh, parents have worked very hard to send me to this school and maybe I should try and make something of myself. <laughs> and so I switched gears a bit. And for me, one of the strategies that I had to learn, I actually used to, we had a, a pool in our backyard where I grew up and I used to pace it. I'd walk around that pool and I would just like think about certain ideas or things that I'd be learning and I would kind of ruminate on it and, you know, work out if I fully understood the concept and how to apply it. And I'm sure my mom, and I know she definitely looked out, used to look out the window and think this, he's a madman. <laughs> <laughs> where do you think that came from? It was that intuition. Honestly, completely completely intuitive. I I think what I realized and still to this day, it's definitely something that I, I'm aware of. I use this when I was writing um, uh, along with writing on my stomach. Yeah, tummy uh, time. Yeah. Yeah, so I have some <laughs> um, interesting tools yeah. um, that won't work for everyone. But, um, but it comes back to, I don't really like sitting down mm. for a long time. Mm -hmm. I would actually prefer to lie down if I'm writing for, for whatever reason. And I would certainly prefer to take a phone call or if I have to think about something rather than just sitting or sort of being stationary, I would much rather go for a walk. Mm, interesting. Um, I wonder if you retain that, that information better when you're, when you're sort of on your feet, mm. especially when you're studying for school. If you think about it, it's just like a rote learning con mm. competition who, yeah. can, who can memorize a paragraph yeah. the best. And I think part of it is because uh, – and, and – I think when I was at high school, there was less distractions, but there were still distractions. Getting out of the the room, getting outside, mm. there was nothing really else to distract me. Yeah, I was just set and focused on that one thought. Yeah, and I would even argue there's there's a cadence to when you're reading or taking mm -hmm. in information. There's there's tends to be a cadence. Like mm -hmm. that's the way I read anyway. Maybe I'm the only one, but I sort of find a nice pace at which I can read the words. Mm -hmm absorb that information and retain it. And when you're walking, we have a cadence, right? You've got this step after yeah, step. Yeah, the rhythm. So maybe it's something to do with the rhythm of, of how the, the mind processes the information. Mm -hmm. I don't know. That's a theory. Maybe we can study that. Anyway, point being uh, taking the phone call, yeah. going for a walk yeah. is another good strategy to get those steps up and, and perhaps break some of the the sitting, the yeah. prolonged sitting down. Uh, do, you, do you have any idea how many steps you get during a gym workout? So the typical workout that you would do, which is strength training or resistance mm -hmm. training, did you know the answer? I'm not sure, but I'm guessing that you probably get more because you're one of those guys that takes up 
a couple pieces of equipment at once <laughs> on different sides of the gym and you pace back and forth between <laughs> them and you have a bag on one and the towel on the other. <laughs> and I, I, you know, uh, I just appreciate that people are there, they're tight for time and I just try and take <laughs> up one one piece of equipment at a time. Good sledge. Uh, so, <laughs> Good sledge. So, so what he's trying to say is, yes, I like my supersets, but I share, okay? When I'm not on that one, anyone can use it. I'm just saying that, all right? Does share. I do share, but you're right. So I'll tell you just, just from, from the data I've gathered, You'll get about three and a half thousand steps just in the gym, which is interesting. Interesting. Yeah. Well, the, like the sort of workouts that the I do. The gym that you work out in is impressively large. Right. Walking between, but I'd say most people will get two to three thousand steps mm -hmm. uh, in a gym. So there's something. So the way I sandwich my day, three and a half thousand steps in the morning with my dog, not that I'm counting it, just this is what it just turned out to be. Three and a half in the, in the morning, three and a half at, at night. So I've already basically my way to 10 a gym session there it is i've hit my 10k and then i never cap it i just try to accumulate as much as possible outside of that um so should we move on to the next little study we can probably race through this one because this could be a six hour podcast mm. if we dive too well, deep let's go as, as sort of deep as we need to now and then we can perhaps get feedback on okay. it and we can go deeper it probably will become a dedicated episode at some point yeah it it, it will i mean the way that I came across this study was that I realized that for many years, I was training so hard in the pursuit of trying to gain that extra sort of bit of muscle or get a bit stronger that I was making a lot of errors. This was when I was a lot younger and obviously less experienced and I, I wasn't yet an exercise physiologist and I hadn't studied this stuff, but my sort of baseline intuition was to just train as hard as possible every single workout. And then the next workout, train even harder. And the next one, even harder. And just keep training harder. Which is a is a sort of admirable mindset, but is a very good way to quickly run into some hurdles. Mm. So there was a study that, that came out, which was a systematic review and meta-analysis, looking at the effects of resistance training to muscular failure on acute fatigue. So they were looking at, in sort of the 24, 48 hours post-workout, how much fatigue had been accumulated from failure training versus non-failure training. Mm -hmm. So just to define some terms off yeah, the bat. So, yeah, what is failure? Yeah, so, so there's essentially two types of failure training. Uh, one is true muscular failure, which is when you literally cannot complete the concentric repetition, no matter how hard you okay. try. And actually, this is, I don't, I don't mean to laugh. <laughs> But I saw this just a few days ago. There was a young kid, inexperienced. He was under a bench press. And is this mm, reminds that's me That's not the place where you want no. true muscular failure, true. mechanical failure. Mechanical muscular failure. Without a spot. Correct. And without um, that's dangerous. pins, like safety racks. Yeah. And the, the gym that we train at, the bench doesn't have safety racks. So You'd think that fitness first would have safety yeah. racks. Yeah. I mean, you think all benches would almost have them. It's, and it's a built-in... You know, mm. the whole machine, the structure can easily support Wait, it. Wait, the safety rack for a bench press, where does that usually so, sit? So, remember we were training um, during COVID at my f at my folks when we were benching. Okay. He, he had the, you, yeah, basically okay. the safety racks would so allow you. what you're you, saying is you have a better setup <laughs> than fitness <laughs> first. A makeshift setup at home, pretty much. Okay. The I think we should rack, find a photo of that because that, yeah. there was, that was anything but safe. <laughs> <laughs> well, did it not work? When you put the weight down, did it crush your it neck? Worked. Did it guillotine you? No. no, you're still here. You're you're healthy. We yeah. benched. We got it. We got our pec gains. Mm. So basically, this young guy was benching and he hit muscular failure, mechanical muscular mm -hmm. failure, meaning no matter how hard he tried, he could not complete the concentric repetition or, or the pushing up phase of the bench press. His muscles were tapping out, mm -hmm. and that weight ended up basically crushing him on his chest and thankfully it didn't roll up to his neck where it would have mm. suffocated him. And there was, you know, people walking by just helped it straight off his chest and, and re-racked mm. it for him. But that's an example of muscular failure. Mm. Then there's a there's technical failure. Which that's is, actually a good point though. If you're going to go, if you're doing a barbell chest press and you're at mechanical failure without a spot, yeah. you want to roll that forward. And you, you, wanna, don't, you don't want to have the collars on either. Mm. So you know where the weights are, how people like use clips or right. collars. You don't want that. Because you, you can't bail. Yeah. You want to be able to push one side up. Imagine you've got the bars resting on your chest. With your right hand, you'd push up and with your left hand, you'd pull down sure. and you yeah. just let the weights fly off. Mm -hmm. It's not safe for people to bow, yeah, but you it's can, safe your life. You can do that maneuver even after you've fail, failed. Yeah. It's pretty easy. Yeah, it's, exactly right. But as you're about to find out, there's actually no need to really go to that point of mm -hmm. mechani uh, mechanical failure. Well, that's called 
ego. <laughs> that's called ego lifting, right? That, that's exactly. I've done my fair share of that. We've all been there. You've got to go there every now and then to learn your, mm. your limits. Uh, so the other side of that coin is technical failure. So this is where you cannot complete another repetition with good form and technique. Mm. So there's another way that you call this in, in sports science literature is reps in reserve or RIR. So if you are at a zero RIR, people think that that means muscular failure, but it actually does not necessarily mean that. It means that you cannot perform another repetition with the same form that you performed on the previous however with many good reps. Form. With good form. You're breaking that form. Correct. So it's like if all of a sudden on, on bench press, you know, you're pushing up with one arm more than the other and the or bar's going on an angle. Or your hips fly up off the bench or mm -hmm. you're, you know, squirming and kicking your feet around. So essentially, we've got these two types of training to failure. In this study, they were looking at uh, mechanical failure, real mm -hmm. training to failure. So the one sure. you would do with a spotter. And they, measured, they measured sort of acute uh, fatigue over the next 24, 48 hours. The reason I find this so interesting is when I look around the gym and I think about sort of youngsters or even anybody who's training to failure day after day because they think it's going to lead to more gains, the research actually shows that you don't need to train to failure. You can and you can get great results, but you do not need to mm. if you want to get hypertrophy and strength And adaptation. what's the downside of going to mechanical failure too, too frequently? Exactly. So this is what this study was looking at and other studies have looked at other downsides. But this particular one was the acute fatigue in the 48 hours pre preceding the workout and how that impacts your, your mood and your daily life mm. and your step count and the incidental non-exercise mm -hmm. activity thermogenesis and all these little things that, you know, contribute to being mm -hmm. healthy. And your next workout. And your next workout. So the other downside of training to failure is that we know that volume or training volume is a very important variable when it comes to gaining size and strength over time. Training to failure set after set actually reduces your total weekly volume. So I'll give you an example. If you We'll take you for example. What is, let's say you, you, you sit down on the bench press and you're going to uh, hit a 10 repetition maximum. So for you, it's probably like 35 kilos. Um, <laughs> so you, you start repping out, you hit your max 10 reps to mechanical muscular failure. We're not talking HI, we're talking total. <laughs> <laughs> total weight, 35 kilos. No, nah, so let's just say 100 kilos on the bar, you hit 10 reps, right? If you take that set to failure, your next set, do you think you're going to hit 10 reps again? Usually not. No, not even, not even usually, close. You'd, you'd be usually, lucky to hit. Usually it drops off. Right. You'd be lucky to hit eight, maybe right. seven yeah. would even be realistic. I'd be quite happy with eight. Right. So imagine now you hit your seven or eight reps to failure again. That's two sets in a row. Mm -hmm. You go back for a third set. You're going to hit six, maybe five. Fourth set, you hit, you know, let's say another five at sure. best. If you work out the total volume of weight you lifted, so 100 kilos times the total rep count, versus if you just did one repetition short of failure for every set, you're going to get way more volume pulling back from failure for those four sets, right? So taking every set to failure will actually reduce your total mm. volume. When if you just keep one repetition in the tank or two. Can you explain that again, how that reduces total volume? So if, if we think about across four sets, how many reps you can complete. Sure. So let's go 10 plus 8 plus 6 plus 5. Mm -hmm. Let's just say that those are the ones you did to failure. Yep. Then, the, then another day, we do another example where it's the same weight on the bar. You go one rep shy of failure for your 10 rep max. Mm -hmm. So we go nine. Yep. You may be able to hit another nine. Okay, so three. you're saying because that first set, you don't take so straight taxing. to failure, you end up doing more total reps across the four sets. Right. So you gotcha. times 100 kilos by how many repetitions you performed. Mm -hmm. That's your tonnage or your, your weight lifted, total weight mm -hmm. lifted. So 10 plus 8 plus 6 plus 5 times 100, that's your tonnage, versus 9, maybe 9 in your second set, then maybe 8 and 7. Total, mm -hmm. total tonnage is higher mm -hmm. in the sets not taken a failure. Just to clarify, we're talking about absolute mechanical failure. Correct. When you literally cannot lift that weight. Right. So Not technical failure where you break form. This is well past that. Correct. And, and you see this a lot. And so what people need to understand is not only is it potentially robbing you of total volume, which is an important mm. predictor of hypertrophy and strength outcomes, but it's also accumulating so much unnecessary acute fatigue that it may influence your just general well-being in the days following mm. your workout. So the, the, the fitness industry has sort of perpetuated this no pain, no gain mentality. Mm. 
of you just got to train harder. And I just, I think that people need to understand that it's not always mm. serving you. Can I ask you a question? Yes. Thanks. Uh, <laughs> I, I think what would be instructive here is if going to mechanical failure all the time is not a good idea. So two things. One is, is it ever a good idea to go to mechanical failure? And the second is, if we're not aiming to get to mechanical failure, uh, I'm pretty experienced in the gym, but I would still say from a textbook point of view, I'm not sure how far I should be taking the set. So how do I work out if I'm not taking it to the point where I literally cannot lift that thing? Yeah. How where do I know, know yeah. is the effective finish point? You're right. Yeah. So, so let, let's go with the first one. So when can we use uh, training to failure as a tool and mm -hmm. can it be beneficial? The answer is yes, it can be beneficial. I would save it for your last set of the day for okay. that exercise. So it doesn't affect everything prior to right. it. Right. So, so if you're going to be doing four sets of bench press, maybe the fourth set you can take to failure and then you're going to move on to another exercise. The problem exercise. with that is if I want to impress people at the gym, <laughs> then then I, I want to be lifting maximum weight yeah, for that when, failure I, set. when I do that failure set. And if I put it at, at the very end of the workout, <laughs> Drew, what you're asking me is to go into that very fatigued already yeah. and my max set where I'm failing and people are looking yeah. is also a very lightweight. Yeah, so when you get up, you, you don't have to go, guys, I swear I could have done more. That but it was my fault. That hurts the ego. Hurts the ego. So, so the, the, the lesson there is ego at the door. Don't worry about anyone else around you. You do you, okay? Everyone does their own workout. The other time the failure can be an actual good tool is if you are using light loads. So mm -hmm. the research tends to show that if you're using loads that are quite light, 30% of your 1RM, which is a light load, mm -hmm. compared to say 80 or 85% of your 1RM. Let's just make that um, a little bit clearer. So if someone's not familiar with that Sorry, terminology, uh, if, if you can lift 100 kilos for one rep. Yeah, repetition maximum is what RM stands for. So a lot of people don't know what their mm. one RMs are because I don't recommend testing one RMs mm. often for exercises as it can be unsafe. But there's a general calculation. Mm. You can figure it out online as well what your sure. calculated one RM mm. is. But let's just say in this scenario, your one repetition maximum is 100 kilos for a lift. If you do 30%, so 30 kilograms, mm -hmm. you can get hypertrophy benefits at that light load if you take those sets very close to failure or to failure. Which means a lot of reps though. Correct. So, so what we're doing here is again, one of these sort of seesaw effects where if you go light loads, your reps have to come up. Mm -hmm. And as long as you take those reps to failure or those sets to failure, I should say, you can still get great benefits mm -hmm. compared to 85% of your one repetition max not taking a failure. I used to use that with some athletes if they were recovering from an injury and we didn't want them under a heavy load, exactly. but we wanted them to help to maintain muscle. Exactly right. That that would be a perfect situation to use this methodology. Because I, I can just hear mm. people saying, so why wouldn't you just do lighter mm. loads all the time? Or why wouldn't you just mm. do heavier loads? Well, the answer is depending on the state of your joints, your muscles, mm. maybe you don't have a good mind-muscle connection and people find it hard to get a good contraction. Mm -hmm. You might want to work on lighter loads and sort of focus mm. on that squeeze and get a bit of a, a pump. And better form. Better technique, correct. So, so if you're inexperienced, it can be a good strategy to develop your form correct. through every exercise, the range of motion, doing it quite s safely or relatively, it's safer than having a heavy load without having good form. Exactly. And, and that sort of 80% 1RM generally lands people in about a 6 to 12 rep range okay. compared to a 30% mm. Uh, 1RM, which is going to take you to like mm. that 20 to 30 repetition max. Um, so I would just suggest that people understand that you actually do have these two options you can use. It's probably good to periodize and use a bit of both. Mm. The other thing to understand is that at higher loads, say 80% of 1RM or higher, as long as you're within three reps short of your maximum failure point. Mechanical or? I mean, mechanical is what most of the research okay. would show, but I don't recommend doing that in, sure. in the gym. So I would say if you're if you've got a three RIR or three reps in reserve, that is that proximity mm. to failure is enough to stimulate some really good results. How do you gauge that accurately? Because I think you and I have trained quite a bit and often we've spoken about how many reps do you think you have left? Yeah. And often 
uh, I would think I had three reps left. Yeah. But if you have someone there supporting you and you have a spot, right. actually you might have a lot more than three. Yeah, and, and the studies show exactly that. So in the studies, the way they gauge it is they, they get you to perform a set. Uh, let's call it a 10 repetition max. So we, we load the bar up with a weight that we think you can get 10 repetitions maximum. You'll start performing repetition after repetition. When you're about three reps out, you're gonna call out and say, I've got three reps left. And then you take that to failure, true muscular failure. Mm -hmm. That's probably the, the best way to figure out what your real limits are. How calibrated are. are you? Not only how calibrated are you, I mean, it, it, the, the spotter or the external motivation will probably get mm -hmm. you an extra rep. If you were on your own, you probably wouldn't get those repetitions, mm -hmm. but it's showing you the quality of contractions left in the muscle. Sure. Right. So, so you call out how many reps you think you have in reserve. So I've got three to go, mm -hmm. and then you rep out. And the funny thing is, in the in the science, most people far underestimate how many reps they have left in the tank. Mm -hmm. They leave three, four, five, sometimes six reps in the tank. So when you think you have three left, that would mean for most people, try and go a little bit further. Yeah, for mo most people are leaving far more than three left. Mm. In so the that's tank. A, that's a very delicate thing to balance, right? Because at the same time, you don't want to be hitting mechanical failure Correct. and then affecting your total volume over the rest of your workout. That's right. So you, you do it under circumstances where you have the environment set up. It's like a testing day. It's mm -hmm. not necessarily your workout day, but it's a testing day. Let's test some repetition maxes. Let's see what we can do with a given load for a given rep range. Understand what your baseline is. Note that. You do a six-week training program and then we go back to it, mm -hmm. retest, and we'll see if you can get better. Mm -hmm. And the science also shows that the more experienced you are at lifting, obviously, you, your your ability to gauge your proximity to failure is better than novice lifters. Uh, and also the closer you give that call out. So imagine if I gave you a load where it was, you know, 50% of your your mm -hmm. 10 RM, right? Or 50% of your, your, your maximum uh, capacity. And I'd say call out when you've got 17 reps to go. That's very hard to know, right? right yeah. So the call out's got to be quite close to failure where it's like mm -hmm. maybe three, four reps out, not 15 reps out. Um, so if you're going to do it, yeah, set yourself up for it, learn these these maxes, and then you can base your training program off the back mm -hmm. of that. So what's the, the, the problem or the downside if you're going into the gym? Let's say you choose a weight, you, it's, you haven't sort of set up a program with all of the testing and whatnot, and you're falling shy of, of true three reps in reserve. So you're doing eight or 12, or let's say you chose a weight where you could do 20, right. but you're finishing that set when when actually you had six or seven reps left. Well, the downside is you're, you're just not optimizing your ability to, to create the gains that you're trying to create. Mm -hmm. So you're just leaving a lot on the table, basically. Mm -hmm. So if you want to optimize, instead of doing five, six sets, a lot of people do multi-set protocols, which is great. Like you want to do, you know, let's say you're going in for, for, for a legs day you're not going to do one set or two sets of legs. Most people are going to do about six sets or more, right, mm -hmm. in general. Multi-set protocols are great. But if all six of those sets are leaving four or five reps on the table, the research shows that three RAR is the sweet spot. Anything below that is where you're getting the most bang for your buck. So you may be better off just doing three really effective, highly stimulating sets that are a true three RIR or mm -hmm. less. So that's going to take a lot of mental power. People don't realize how hard a true three RIR can be. Mm -hmm. So that's what I was going to ask you because I think uh, some people will be listening and, and just might not be fully sure if they're getting to that three rep in reserve mark. Mm -hmm. What what would you feel? What would you expect to feel when you're at that point versus either falling short of it or at mechanical failure, which I think is mechanical failure. I think most people can appreciate what that is. Right. So... What, good question. What you're going to see is if you're going to a three RIR with a light load, where you're at that 30 rep maximum mm. uh, ability, you're going to feel incredible lactic acid buildup. So burn, okay. burning sensation is number one. You may not feel the same lactic acid buildup at say an eight repetitions mm -hmm. or let's say you're eight to 10 to 12. Because it's much quicker. It's more mechanical tension from the weight or the load that you're lifting, but you're not having a metabolic lactic acid effect that you would get from high repetitions. Mm -hmm. So you'd feel a burn with high reps, but for the the general theme of both of these, you're going to see a reduction in the velocity of that bar movement 
or whatever the exercise is. Okay, so we're so looking keeping for your eye on that. When does the yeah, you know when the, the rep speed, speed the slows bar. down and you feel that you start to grind and it's really, you know, rep one mm. and two are moving really nicely mm. and they're sort of flying up off your chest. So we're benching. But you've got to stop yourself from your mind causing the bar velocity Which to drop. can happen. Because the moment you start thinking about that, when it gets tough, you might inadvertently drop the velocity of the bar from your That's mindset right. yeah. and then go, okay, set's That's finished, right. but you haven't actually taken it to the right uh, number of reps from a muscular fatigue point of view. That's exactly right. So there's a, that's the sort of the reverse psychology <laughs> aspect of it where people talk themselves into the bar velocity reducing so that they can terminate okay. the set early. Um, so this comes down to intention. So every time you get, you, you set your mind with an intention for the set you're going to perform, You've got to go in there expecting the pain. You've got to, we've got to feel that dark sort of pain mm. of, of, you know, gym training. Even though it hurts, it's, we know we're going to get the benefits and it can actually be quite enjoyable. Like that, I know it sounds sadistic, but so that, no that pain. So no pain, no gain then is, there's, there's a grain of truth to that. There's a grain of truth. But you don't want to feel like you're dead at the end of a set because there's a bar lying on top of you. That is exactly right. So <laughs> some pain for some gain. That's the way I, I think okay. we put it. So I think we some got is there. good. We got that. Um, <laughs> what about uh, working out total volume for a program over a, a week? You know, if I'm thinking about a particular muscle group, let's say, for example, I want to build strength and size of uh, my glutes and quads. Mm -hmm. uh, what how many times do I need to get into the gym and how many sets do I need to do over a week to actually have a total volume that would constitute enough volume to get some sort of benefit? So the research in this field is actually pretty clear and there's quite a lot of it. There's sort of three parameters you want to be hitting. Number one we, we spoke about is your repetitions in reserve or your proximity to failure. So assuming you're taking most of your working sets to about a three RIR or less, three, two, one, zero, you're in the sweet spot of actually getting enough stimulus to get some adaptations. The next thing you're looking at is your frequency. How many times a week are you training each muscle group? And the research shows that training each muscle group twice a week is better than training each muscle group once a week, even when volume is equated, right? So if you can spread your volume across two workouts rather than smashing it all in one workout, it's probably going to be better for you. You're getting that stimulus twice during the week. Interestingly, three times a week does not seem to be better than two times a week. So two times a week is the sweet spot. So if you're doing, say, uh, you know, an upper lower program, mm -hmm. legs twice a week, upper body twice a week is sort of where you want to be. And the sets have been shown to be anywhere from about 10 sets per muscle group per week up to about 20 sets per week. So that's where push, pull, legs is also a, quite a popular split. It's a good split, split too, yeah. With a day off. That's right. And you end up hitting all of those twice. Exactly. When you say hit a uh, body part twice, right, If is that an isolated exercise? Like, for example, if I'm training back, does that count as biceps or does there have to be specific isolated bicep exercises? Yeah, so th this is where you've just got to be a critical thinker and understand that like you said, when you're doing a squat or any multi-joint compound movement, other muscles are going to play a role. But I like to think about it as the target muscle group. So on a leg day, if you're you know trying to target your quads, if you're doing twice a week legs and you're going to hit your quads for a minimum, mm -hmm. we call it a minimum effective volume is one of the, the terminologies. Minimum effective volume would be 10 sets of quads per week. Mm -hmm. And the maximal, reco maximal recoverable volume would be about 20. And this isn't black and white. Obviously, there's a lot of gray and everyone's a bit different. But in general, if you're, if you're just starting out, let's say you want to do a six-week block of training, it would be intelligent to start with the minimum effective volume, which is about 10 sets per week per muscle group, and progress over the six sure. weeks to about 20 sets per week per muscle group. And that's going to be dependent on, back to our earlier points, within each of those sets, how, how, what's your intention how close to mechanical failure are you going? Right. Are you getting to that that stage of three reps in reserve? Right. Because because uh, if you think about ten sets per week for a muscle group, let's talk about the biceps for a second. Mm -hmm. I've never seen you doing isolated bicep curls <laughs> in the gym. 
Is, am I just? Why, am why I, I don't have biceps? <laughs> is, it, is that just a coincidence? No, or? no, no. I love the compound lifts. Uh, and I just enjoy it more. So, like okay. for me, weighted pull-ups is just. I, I love that kind of training. I still do some supplementary, like little bicep work okay. here and there. But what I do is, I just do the minimum effective volume that I think will get me there. Mm-hmm. And some people will be like, wait, ten sets per week. Like some people go in for a chest day and do twenty-five sets right. in one workout. And a lot of those sets, according to the, the research, is is what we call like sort of junk volume where Mm. you're getting the stimulus from the first six to 10 sets Mm. and everything after that is accumulating stress and fatigue. Some people just like to be in the gym. Some people like that's which is fine. But if we're talking about optimizing a training program and being evidence-based, those extra 10, 15, 20 sets beyond the volumes that you actually need, it's going to burn some calories Mm. and it's going to make you feel good maybe, but it's probably not as effective as, as actually finding the dose that is going to give you the most bang for your buck. So, I think that those sort of three things, proximity to failure, frequency, and volume, th- th- those are the variables you want to build a foundational training program upon. I think it would be remiss of me not to ask you, uh, again, we'll dedicate an episode to this and kind of dive deeper and, and um, help people make sense of all of it because there is a lot of information here. But uh, there, there are a number of bodybuilders that seem to be having cardiovascular issues mm. and guys in their early 40s having heart attacks and dropping dead. And of course, there are various contributions to that probably outside of the training that they do alone. Mm. That's a whole other conversation. But it makes me me wonder about the, the role and the importance of aerobic versus mm. anaerobic exercise in this discussion of not just creating or producing developing muscle and being strong but also being aerobically fit cardiovascular fit so that we have more years to to make use of our added muscle and strength Mm. really important um that you brought this up like you said the bodybuilding industry has had a number of young deaths especially in the last couple of weeks there's i think there's six bodybuilders in the last say month or two have died and they've all been in the age you know, from 30 years old in some in, the, in their 20s, some in the late 30s, maybe early 40s. But anyone would agree that that's too young to, to be dying in the pursuit of, you know, some biceps mm. and some muscles. It just doesn't seem... I think some of that, there's a, you know, with social media and it's, it's a, you know, outdoing the next person. And of course, there are steroids involved in this, sure. right? Sure. And... And many uh, other drugs. I'll so how about. much of this is education versus regulating the competitions so that yeah. it's it's not just get bigger, 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 bigger and, and you know, putting mm. young, impressionable people's lives uh, at risk. Yeah, I mean, I, I would say that the, I reckon the foundation, the, the um, organizations that put on these events should definitely have a, have a element, more of an element of safety within the protocols of whether you're natural or enhanced or, but again, mate, social media, it's just, it's too easy to, to promote yourself and flaunt what you've got and build a following. And and this is what most of the guys care about is how much muscle they can pack on, which the irony of the whole thing is that the one muscle that they don't pay any attention to is the most important muscle. Mm. It's not the pecs or the biceps. You can't see it. It's the myocardium. Is that what they call it? The heart, right? That is the muscle we should be prioritizing. Mm-hmm. And the reason bodybuilders don't do much cardio or aerobic training, or, or I shouldn't say all bodybuilders, but many bodybuilders don't like going there is because of this so-called interference effect that cardiovascular training can blunt your response to resistance training and you might not get as big. I, I just think we need to make endurance training cool again because mm-hmm. it's so important. It's so, so valuable uh, for, for longevity and heart health and building aerobic yeah. capacity and it just needs to be something that we talk about more but mm-hmm. what's cool about running on a treadmill versus you know hitting that one rm you know mm-hmm. it's just not going to go viral the guy who had a great half marathon time yeah you know? there are some guys like uh there's a, a a well-known trainer at golds in venice yeah you'll see him every time you go in there and i've, I've kind of come to get to know him over the years his name's mike ryan and he um he's trained like the rock and bunch of NFL players and he is very big on cardio okay uh, but it is that more do 45 minutes an hour sort of sandwiched in yeah coming back to our discussion earlier 
around just trying to not only do that, but stay active throughout the day Mm. is a little bit counterintuitive to someone who is wanting to preserve energy and grow. Right. And if you are doing what we said before, training really, really hard and hitting failure on every set because you're trying to be the world's best bodybuilder, you're not left with much fuel in the tank for the rest of the day and you're absolutely Mm. buggered. The central nervous system, the fatigue, the systemic fatigue, it's very easy to just sit around all day and let your muscles grow Mm. and force feed huge amounts of calories so that you can build back, you know, be be bigger than before. Uh, And I just think that's a recipe for long-term problems and we're we're seeing it. That's, That's so sad seeing these youngsters passing away. And as you said, a lot of them are on performance enhancing drugs and steroids and that plays a huge role too. So we're not just saying that not doing cardio is is causing this, but it's it's going to be something that would would certainly help you to to at least reduce the risk of mm-hmm. these complications. I mean, when you when you consider even outside of competitions, the it's it's very enticing or it must be very enticing if you're in the fitness industry and your income is derived through sponsorships mm. and various brands paying you to promote their products, a lot of that opportunity comes back to how big you are and mm. what you look like. That's right. Your and body it becomes yeah. a race. Your body is your business card. And um, yeah, it's, it's sad seeing it though. It's not good. Okay. Well, let's change gears here a little bit. Mm-hmm. Um, I think we, you mentioned some good news of the week before. Let's do. Let's finish off on interesting books, movies, documentaries, or podcasts. Okay. Do you want to go first? Yeah. Well, you, you can close it out. I'll, I'll get this out of the way. In terms of books, I'm very late to the party, but I'm reading Orwell's 1984. It's taken me a long time to actually build the courage to get get into it. It's mm-hmm. a, it's How's it going? Mean, I'm like a few pages in. Okay. Yeah. Um, Audio um, or no? Actual? I'm reading the. I bought the book. Hard do, copy. do you consider audio reading? Like if, no. if you do an audio, how, can you say at a dinner party? You read the book. Oh, I read that book. No, I would say you, you listen to the book. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> I don't. I, I actually think there's something about those words entering your eye and getting into the mm. brain through through your eyes that does something. I'm sure more more qualified people can talk about yeah. this, but I, I'd say that there's a big difference between how your brain inter- interprets yeah. that. I did hear something neat where they ran an experiment and kids actually learned better if they had the audio on and were reading at the same time. Well, mate, that that makes me think about the current, I mean, everyone listening will know this, the current sort of Instagram, TikTok captioned um, posts. You're drawn to the ones that it's, you do it. You do it all the time. Talking to camera with you know, the mm. captions and it's really easy to, yeah. to read it as it's coming out. And I think so. You get the yeah. double and I, I definitely learn better doing that. Mm. In fact, I sometimes, just as a little test, I'll just cover the caption with my hand and try to just look into the person's eyes and listen and I just don't retain the information as well. Yeah. As I mean, I, I watch documentaries with subtitles on do for you? that reason. Really? Yeah. Okay, that I don't do. Yeah, that's interesting. I got into that habit a while ago, and and now if I watch a documentary without the subtitles, it doesn't feel right. Interesting. I'll, I'll, I'll give that a go. Although I don't want to become dependent on seeing these captions mm. to, to, you know, get smarter. Um, Anywho, so I'm reading over 1984. In terms of podcasts, one that I found really interesting I listened to the other day was um, Sadhguru on Joe Rogan. I know I listen to a lot of Joe Rogan, but I do enjoy his podcast despite disagreeing with his carnivorous diet. Um, but that was a really interesting episode. It was what, what particularly uh, got me was hearing someone push back against Joe. So Joe would sort of, a lot of guys are like yes men and they sort of- mm. Joe was like a little kid in that episode. I know, wasn't it amazing? But I love that. that that's actually what I like about Joe the best yeah. is that he has a childlike curiosity. Yeah. And he brought that to that episode. Yeah. And many times he said things to Sadhguru. Yeah. Sadhguru said no. No. <laughs> that's not at all what it is. Yeah. And, he was just, he uh, shut him down. And yeah, he went a completely different direction. Yeah. It was it was interesting. So other than the information that I found, you know, it was, it was inspiring- um, Although I will say that, that that information, despite being extremely inspiring in the moment and you feel like sort of uplifted, mm. it, it's very easy for, for 10 seconds later for you've forgotten that inspirational mm. quote or that, you know, beautiful throwaway line that hit you at the time. And then, you know, sure. you just fall back into your mm. traps of, of the way we live our lives. But I thought it was a good episode in particular, seeing this sort of, uh, you know, this figure of authority in, in the space being Sadhguru talking to Rogan and seeing just the power dynamics. Mm. It was just so different. Usually you've got Rogan who sort of 
really dominates conversation. He, he's the one who, I wouldn't say argues, but he likes to have healthy debate uh, with people who he disagrees with. And he does it on his podcast all the time. But in this particular episode, I just didn't see him do mm. that at all. And I, I wonder if it was like yeah. a spirituality thing or. Well, I think Sadhguru is obviously you know, tremendously wise. And yeah. he he has a beautiful way of describing things mm. and was able to navigate it and explain things to Joe and get Joe thinking in a different way. Yeah. And to an earlier point about getting things off our chest and not holding on to things, I'm pretty sure Sadhguru in that episode, I know I've heard him speak before, that's one of the things that he really emphasizes, that someone else really cannot change your mood. Yes. It's whether you decide to take on what they said. Yes, you you, you are entirely responsible for how you respond. Mm. He, he used the term respond and react. Mm. And that's agency. Um, that's agency. If I can get a reaction out of you, I'm in control mm -hmm. of you. And if, but, but how I choose to respond is what really comes down to agency. I loved that. That That is something that I think everyone can take with them daily. Like the amount of people out there who are trying to trigger others and get reactions. Well, if you're, if you're in control of your response, no mm. one, no one can create that And they don't know what to do with that. Yeah. It's, it can diffuse it really quickly. So it's a good episode. I recommend people listen to it. The last thing I'll add in here for the, um, another podcast is, Again, maybe I'm late to the party, but I just discovered Ricky Gervais and Sam Harris have a podcast together called Absolutely Mental. Rick, he, Ricky Gervais yeah, is classic. He is so funny. I just can't believe it's such a sort of polarizing personality. You've got Ricky Gervais, this like very funny, humorous guy, and then you've got Sam Harris, who's more of that sort of intellect, philosophical, and then the, the bridge between them being humor, it just works so well. Mm -hmm. And then the, I just laugh so much during this. Um, and interestingly, Ricky Gervais, I think, recently came out and said that he's now vegan and he's always been an animal ad, ad, uh, activist and a sort of advocate mm. for animal welfare. So I just I just thought this would be a, a nice way for people to, mm. to have a good laugh. Yeah, that's day -day. cool to see. Yeah. Okay, so absolutely mental. Yeah. Uh, and mine are, firstly, uh, I, I don't know who won the Formula One this morning, Bahrain round one, so don't tell me. Um, <laughs> but I'm I'm very intrigued to see what the results were. Uh, so my first one is actually a documentary. It's Drive to Survive, and it's the Formula One documentary on Netflix. And this I've I've always enjoyed Formula One, but I'll say that this show, this is season four, mm -hmm. has given me such a, a deeper appreciation for the for the sport in general and also into the minds of the drivers and the way that they think. And uh, I find it totally fascinating to the point where uh, in September this year, I'm in Italy and I'm, I'm going to try and get to Monza. Oof. So if anyone has any hookups at the uh, the Monza uh, Grand Prix, feel free to let me That's know. That's unreal. You've never been to Formula One live? I have been to Abu Dhabi. Oh, okay. Yeah. Cool. Um, that was before I really started getting into Formula One though. Yeah. So I didn't really appreciate the, the event. Um, so I'm, I'm kind of hanging out to, to go again and see it, mm. uh, witness it in person. Um, secondly, uh, Rich Roll brought out his new book, Voicing Change, uh, Volume 2, I think it's called, which is uh, a select feature of uh, words of wisdom uh, important messages from his conversations that he's had over the years. There was volume one out, I think, last year, and then this is volume two. So you can um, get that. I haven't seen it yet, but I do have Voicing Change volume one. It's incredible. It's got amazing photography and stories and is very inspiring. So um, I know that you can buy that through his website. I'll put a link to that into the show notes. And then lastly, to, to plug this show. <laughs> uh, and I think I mentioned it before, uh, the Justin Sonnenberg and Erica Sonnenberg episode. By the time this goes up, that will have already been up. Mm -hmm. And I suspect that's going to be a very, very popular episode about our microbiome and its role in our health, uh, how it is integrated and uh, directly connected to our immune system and how our modern industrial uh, lifestyle has really changed the shape and composition of our microbiome and then what we can do to actually help shift it back in a direction that leads to more favorable uh, outcomes and, and better health. And uh, as I said earlier, get that pharmacy in the gut 
working for you so that you're dispensing all of these powerful molecules like short chain fatty acids. So um, that's the three from me. Awesome. Uh, I think we did it, mate. Thank you. Awesome. For coming back. How long was that? Feels like a marathon of an episode. Yeah, just shy of three hours. So uh, I think we <laughs> we tried to cap it at one and a half, but we, we just couldn't do it. We we definitely covered some ground, yeah. and I think uh, if you're enjoying this episode, we would love for you to send us your thoughts or comments or ideas. You can email into hello at theproof.com. You can make suggestions for things that you would like us to cover, and we'll try and work that into our outline for future episodes. Awesome. Thanks, mate. Thank you. That was so much fun. Love it. Thank you for joining me for this episode and your interest in science-based conversation. I hope you enjoyed it and found the information covered interesting and instructive. If you did and you'd like to show your support for the show, please subscribe to our YouTube channel where you can stay up to date with new episodes and watch them in video format. Yes, the full-length videos. Please also consider subscribing to the show on the Spotify and or Apple podcast app, wherever you enjoy listening to podcasts. You can also leave a review on Apple or Spotify. Again, a great way to support the show and make our content more discoverable for others to enjoy and learn from. If you have any comments about the episodes, suggestions for future episodes, including guests you'd like to see on the show or questions that you'd like to have answered, please leave those in the comments section on YouTube. I myself and my team will take note of these comments when planning future episodes. Finally, the best way to support the show and receive discounts on products we love is by checking out our sponsors at theproof.com forward slash friends. Enjoy your week, stay well, and I look forward to catching you in the next episode.